Welcome to the On Point Podcast, a channel dedicated to helping you be the best hunter you can be. On Point is designed to help motivate and inspire you to get more out of yourself and your gear during your next hunt. If you're looking for information that will directly impact your success and help inspire you to go on new adventures, whether you're hunting with a bow or a rifle, On Point is the channel for you. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of the podcast where I got to sit down with Team Dirty Trad, a.k.a. Anthony Maldonado and Chris Dunlap from Elk River Archery. We talked about broadheads for about two and a half hours, uh, single bevel, double bevel, traditional style, three in one, the mechanicals, all of it, four blades versus three blades versus two blades, really covered it all. And then really an, an aspect that I love where it went is the delivery system to get that broadhead there. So we had the arrow episode already. This kind of expanded on that, but really focused on the broadheads. But you still need a good delivery system, like Chris says. You still need a good setup to get that arrow there. If you have no energy when that arrow hits that animal or hits that destination, it doesn't matter really what broadhead you have because um, you're not going to get that penetration to, to do the job. So uh, a lot of really good information here. It may take you a while to listen to. I uh, may have to listen to it a couple times because there's so much information here. But uh, please let me know what you think. Leave me a five-star review. I will be doing a giveaway uh, at the end of the podcast for one lucky person who left a five-star review with a comment and got entered in my giveaway. So this episode is brought to you by Let's do Elk River Archery, who's based out of Oregon. That's uh, Chris Dunlap's shop, who is on the podcast this episode, like I said, and uh, giving him a shout-out. Great guy, very knowledgeable, super tunes, your arrows, your bow, just does all the work to get you the best accuracy possible. So if you guys are in Oregon or if you have any questions, um, you want to order something, give Chris a shout-out. Um, he gives you all of his contact information in the episode and then i'll also put some of it below and then uh let's give a shout out and try and grow uh team dirty trad anthony maldonado's instagram so if you want to follow him and uh, help support him let him grow on instagram it's team dirty trad and uh, he's posting stuff on there more than he was I, i'm trying to convince him to do something with it but we'll see if he does or not so that's all i have for today i will see you guys at the end of the episode enjoy Uh, we have a guest coming on the show. He's, he's um, getting ready to make his grand entrance. I guess that's what you could call it. Yeah. Identify yourself, sir. Oh, everyone here has seen me before. Still Anthony. You look fairly ripped. Well, that's what happens when you go to the gym. In block. the forearm territory. Yeah, you just work. The key is to only work out like three muscles, <laughs> and then they get bigger, and then if I stood up too quick, I'd fall over. You know, skip leg day. <laughs> He's wearing my shirt, so that's why he looks so buff. Yeah, well, yeah, because I didn't think we were going to do any video, and I just got from the gym, so it's just gross. And he's like, oh, I'm going to do some Instagram stuff. I'm, like, I'm going to need a T-shirt. There you go. So this episode is going to be about broadheads and everything broadheads. We have a guy that has been here around. He's been around for a while, and he's done one of the most extensive broadhead tests that I've seen. Um, so I'm just going to leave this running for a little bit. You guys will actually see how we uh, make a podcast. I'll shut you off here in a little bit. But um, if you have a question or you have a broadhead that you have a question about, this guy probably has the answer. So let's go ahead and start recording. I'm going to look over here every once in a while, act like you guys are just a fly on the wall. But uh, make sure you do leave a comment if you have a question. I will try and get those answered for you. But um, So let's go ahead and get this thing rolling then. Cool. So uh Get some introductions going. Why don't you get Dirty Trad going first? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> been on here before. Uh, I think Garrett's talked about me before, but mm -hmm. small Instagram. Uh, I, I hate even saying it anymore. Team Dirty Trad, because when I, that became an idea, there was more than just me. So, now the team is me, myself, and then there's I. Um, so, yeah. it's, it's a one-man wolf pack team, but... Yeah. <laughs> I'm not joining that Warpock anytime soon, yeah. by the way. No dedication. <laughs> I might join. Yeah. See, you, you might go. go trad? You know, I'm actually very strongly considering it for next year. Well, really? Mm -hmm. For elk, deer? Yeah. 
both. Both. Yeah. Jesus, diving straight in. Eighteen years of compounds, man. You know, hmm. time to try something else. So, Maybe try and one up Aaron Snyder. You can kill six animals your first year instead of like. I don't have that kind of time. But. <laughs> so what? What drove me to it was one target panic. It was the initial drive. Yeah. And then what drove me a hundred times harder? I was just thinking about this earlier today. Was some people? One of the pr- people I even hunt with or used to hunt with them a lot when i said i think i'm gonna i'm gonna fully do this and hunt with it the naysayers that's way too hard you'll never be able to do it i got a few of those and i was like you know what i'm just gonna prove everyone wrong screw you (laughs) i'm gonna that was the biggest push and then last year i hunted with it mostly but you did you did even in the late season blacktail which i was pretty impressed that you still stuck it out but this year i'm not gonna take a compound thing so well, perfect. So, well, who else we got here? Ah, this Chris Dunlap, Elk River Archery. No stranger to the podcast. Nope. nope. Done one before. Hopefully, we're going to do another one after this at some point. Absolutely. I am fired up to have you back on the show because after we did that arrow episode, I realized I got a lot of stuff to learn <laughs> when it came to the arrows. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a really good episode and, and and I got a lot of really good feedback and that is still one of the best episodes we've done yet as far as results and feedback and, and listens and downloads. It was a really good episode. So having having you being able to come back and then talk about another area of your genius basically that you've really just dug into, dove it, just dove straight into it. And, and like I said, the most extensive broadhead test that I've ever seen. Well, how many broadheads did you test? Well, I've tested more than more than just that one test. Mm-hmm. I've done several individual tests where I test two or three. That one test was 29 broadheads. 29 broadheads. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you, doing those all in one day <laughs> was the biggest pain in the butt, I think. <laughs> I'll never do anything like that again. It was just too much. Yeah. But, um, you know, we tested them. For those of you that haven't seen the test... We did a long range accuracy test. So mm-hmm. I knew my bow was tuned really well and should be able to shoot any broadhead. And so we tested that. And then we tested through ballistics gel and I had put a deer hide up. So I got a little, I had some deer hide from the year before that I hadn't taken. Normally I take them to the glove company mm-hmm. in Salem and give them deer hide to give me a free pair of gloves. But uh, I thawed that out and put it on the ballistics gel so we could see kind of the cuts and the holes that the broadheads made. Mm -hmm. And then the most important test in my mind was the bone test. And that's the test I get the most hate out of. Oh, you know, the deflection test or, well, it wasn't a deflection test. It was literally a uh, broadhead durability. And then what broadheads make it through the bone, what don't. And like I talked about in the arrow uh, podcast, it taught me something, you know, it, it really, started opening my eyes to having to think about different things, <clears throat> understanding that the bone density from one animal to the next and, you know, and why did this one penetrate? Again, I, everything I do, why? Yeah. Why did that do that? I want to know why. I want to be able to dissect the why. So that's the hard part with all these testings. You see all these broadhead tests, and I've told you before, the ballistics gel was almost useless, really, when it came down to it. You can see a wound channel. You can see a single bevel where it twists mm-hmm. some. Um, but other than that, I didn't get anything out of it because it doesn't really show you penetration. So There, Chris needs more volume. Oh, so. More volume. There you go. Um, so I kind of wanted to go over into, into some of the weeds here <clears> too because um, I'm, go- I'm always good for going into the weeds here and rabbit holes. How, how uh, I want to go over thickness and types of metal. And, and stuff like that too. Yeah, and I'm not an expert on the different okay. metals, but I can go through. You know, I can go through the ones I know, and and um, we can talk about the different hardnesses and what's what's important with the different hardnesses. Um, but you know, I mean, we can start wherever you want. You know. Yeah. Well, let's just go over um, from from your aspect. I want to go over because um, everybody has their opinions on on what broadhead's the best, and my question is. To them, with you know, I get asked, "What broadhead should I shoot? How'd you like the kudus? How'd you like this broadhead? How'd you like that broadhead?" And when I put them in the vitals, I love that broadhead because yeah. typically it it's it's an animal that I found and I've got a decent blood trail with it. I mean, I've got multiple kills with multiple different broadheads, and when I hit them right through the lungs, I've never lost an animal. 
So you know what the the long and short answer to that <laughs> is there is no answer. Right. Some of it's subjective to what you're hunting. Exactly. You know, there is not, at least in my opinion, there's not one perfect broadhead that is the end all be all. That is the broadhead. Mm -hmm. Only shoot that one. You know, now, right now with what I hunt, I only shoot iron wheels. That's what I personally shoot. And there's a lot of reasons. We'll get into those reasons here in a little bit. A lot of broadheads are decent. There are some that are just plain junk, in my opinion. They're crap. <laughs> and uh, as Anthony points to some of the some of the mechanicals. We just talk crap about that broadhead right there. <laughs> the the uh, hate is going to start flowing through the screen. Uh, the, hate, the hate will start flowing for a lot of things, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to shut you guys off, but you have to listen to this podcast come next Monday. Bye. So, yeah. you know, it, it kind of... I'm going to tell my story. I told you I was going to tell it. So, you know, the hate's going to come because I got told a story today about some friends of mine met another guy and they just happened to bring my name up. Yeah. And that guy's like, oh yeah, I know who he is. That guy hates kudu and his broadhead <laughs> test was crap. He was specifically picking on kudu. Huh. I don't pick on anybody, man. I, I honestly, I don't care. Now, have I said that I think kudus are weak? Have I said that I don't think they're good heads? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what I've said because the tests I've done those broadheads break. They bend. They don't keep cutting diameter. And again, we're going to get into all of that. But um, yes, yes. You know, the, the bottom line is for people, if somebody comes to me, what broadhead should I shoot? I'm going to say, this is my experience with all the broadheads I've, test, mm -hmm. I've tested. And this would be my recommendation. Right now, if somebody was to ask me, what's my recommendation? If you want a price point broadhead, I'm going to tell you to go with an Exodus. If you want to step up to a broadhead that's, I don't want to say better, but I'm going to say better, mm -hmm. I would go to an iron wheel. Um, if you want to get, you know, a really, a very tough, durable arrow and you're really interested in FOC, mm -hmm. I would say the Valkyrie heads, you know, there's a lot of other ones out there, but those three I like for different reasons. Well, I, I think you touched on it there. There's different there's different levels and there's different broadheads for different folks. You got a big difference between what the broadhead and a six pack of muzzies is versus a iron wheel. There is light and day differences in there. Granted, we're on different ends of the spectrums. Am I bashing on muzzies? No, I've killed a lot of animals with muzzies. The cheap ones to the MX3s. I've got a trocar sitting right here, which I plan on probably using for elk this year. So, um, you know... I, I use them all as well. Um, you've, you've got a lot more experience with them. But when I get somebody that says, what broadhead should I use? First of all, what's your setup? What are you shooting for, for weight? Because if you're using a 360 grain arrow and you're planning on shooting an expandable, I've heard you want a lot more weight with expandables. That's just what I've heard. I can't really use them here in Oregon. Um, are you shooting low poundage light arrow? Well, you're probably going to want a cut on contact instead of uh, a four blade, you know, like one of these toothy arrows right here, or this black hornet, which has a really steep angle with really steep um, bleeders. Um, that's that's really yeah. Well, that worked last year on that bull um, with a really light arrow setup, but she only got 15 inches of penetration. Yeah. So I listen, I listened to one of your podcasts today. You actually put it on the heavy side. So oh really? Because I'm I'm really big about weight and everything. So going into last bow season with her setup, <laughs> yeah. I was nervous. Like I. I was just like, I don't know about this, but we were shooting a heavier setup, but what you were talking about earlier, you know, shoots a perfect bullet hole, shoot broadheads, just garbage. You know, it just, they start diving off. So I couldn't figure it out. Well, I went to a shorter arrow, which was lighter, but she'd been shooting for 3D and stuff. And you, she could shoot broadheads out to 70, no problem. Yeah, so, that's a spine issue. Yep, so mm -hmm. it was a spine issue. So, and now we're talking like, we're two weeks away from season. And so I'm like, okay, well... We'll just run that setup since it, it works. And I know it works. We'll just run that setup. And so her arrow, we were shooting this broadhead on a black. So that's, that's the Magnus. Yeah, yep. yeah I guess, because people can't and see. it's just, it's sh short and wide mm -hmm. with steep leaders. And that's that's the typical design anymore for, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, 85% of the broadheads out there. Yep. Yeah, so. Short and steep. And it was she was shooting it on a Black Eagle Outlaw, so standard diameter even. Came in at three hundred and thirty five grains. And she hit the near rib and it broke right through that. 
And then, yeah, it only went in, I don't know, about that far. Yeah, that's still plenty of penetration. So I what mean. I think it did is I think it, because it, it kind of bounced out. What I think it did is it made it to the off rib and just hit it and kind of come out. Yeah. 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 And like that, that bowl only went 10 yards? Yeah he, yeah. he only took like a big bound or two and was yeah. dead. You know, so I'm going to make a blanket statement here on this stuff. <clears throat> you can kill with, you know, a shot placement is everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, that trumps all. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kill with any broadhead. So the guys who listen to this podcast and as we get farther into this, they go, well, you know, I'm using the Allen broadheads from Walmart and they kill just fine. Yeah. You're right. When everything goes perfect, they kill just fine. And even when things don't go perfect, they still kill just fine. When things go south, they don't. And I think every person out there, I'm going to be mean here, but unless you're a complete douchebag, mm -hmm. wants a good, quick, clean kill. They mm -hmm. don't want to wound animals. It's not just a, it weighs heavy on you when you wound an animal. Right. It's not just a blow it off. Oh, I'm off to the next one. You know, at least for me, you know, maybe I'm putting my own ethics on everybody else. But when I've wounded animals and I have, mm -hmm. it weighs really heavy on me, you know, and so I re I replay yeah. everything and I want to know why and what did I do wrong? And, you know, and I'll go back for weeks looking I wounded, for, uh, I wounded an elk one year about five years ago and. I don't like saying that, but I did. I wounded an elk, and it was right at the beginning of season. And I, every day I could, I kept going back in there. Well, I finally found the bull. Of course, it's it'd been six days. Looking for birds, looking for yeah, smell, mm -hmm. whatever. I found it with my nose. Mm -hmm. I, I all of a sudden got a big whiff of it, and I just started paying attention to the wind and yep. just kind of moved. So I found him right at the beginning of season. I punched my tag. Yeah. And some of the guys I hunt with are like, why would you do that? I'm like, because I'm done. That, I Granted, I didn't get any meat out of it, but I killed that elk. It's your tag's good for one elk. Yep. So there it is. You know, yeah. I, I I think that's the ethical thing. I think that's probably the legal thing to do. I'm not really sure how what the legal uh, I thing think is. That to could do. go either way. Oh really? They, then they could go. If, well, if you how, do, head, how do you know that you killed that bull? That you, how do you know that's your bull? And now you're tagging uh, a bull that might not be your. You know, I don't know. Hmm. I'm not a cop. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I but ethically, I would do the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's yep. like if I know it's my animal. That was my animal. Yeah. Yeah. Then I'm going to take, you know, the horns and no, I can't eat them. And, you know, yeah, it's a sad thing. And guys are going to go, well, you're wasting your tag and you didn't get any meat. And what enjoyment do you get out of that? It's not the enjoyment. It's the, it's the learning process, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's knowing that that was my animal. That was my shot, you know, and, and that's what I'm going to take. So, you know, getting into this broadhead thing, the number one thing that drives me crazy, like if I could... Again, I always say I'm going to get hate mail. <laughs> but the number one thing that drives me crazy is guys will literally spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars mm -hmm. buying the best binos they can, you know, buying the, the, the latest and greatest camo, buying a brand new bow, you know, buying just whatever. And then they want to go buy the cheapest broadheads they can. Right. I knew where what? he was going with that before. As soon as you started talking, because I've said that exact thing. What's killing the animal, guys? Yeah. It is, it's the broadhead. That's what actually does the killing part, you know? And there's other things that go along with it. It's not just a blanket, well, the broadhead does all the killing, because there's arrow shaft stuff that we, that we need to get into and, and structural integrity. What I want guys to think about is think about, think about it as a whole delivery system. Like Brent Hahn from Valkyrie, he talks about his center pin system, and it's a delivery system. I think everybody, if they could, or if they did, think about their arrow setup as a delivery system. It's the delivery system for what does the killing. So what do I need to do to make that the most effective and efficient that I can? Because out of respect for the animal and out of all the time and money we spend, I mean, how many shot opportunities do we get at elk? Mm -hmm. Deer seem to be a little bit easier, but not, not big bucks. You know, right. So if you have one good shot at an elk all year and you don't have a good delivery system, how much time and money did you just waste? You know, now I, I call it a waste and guys, are, it's not a waste. I'm having, well, yeah, you're having fun. I get it. Right. But most people that go hunting, they do go out there with the goal of being able to harvest an animal. You want to see all the other things that go with it. But the end game is I'm putting some meat in the freezer. I'm having a good time. So we spend all this time, we take our vacation, you know, piss our wives off because we take vacation <laughs> hunting when we should be taking them to Hawaii or something, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we go cheap. What 
the one step beyond that that drives me crazy is the guys that go, hey, look at these broadheads I got off of eBay. Yeah. And they're Chinese knockoffs. Yeah, I was going to go What in the living hell are you doing, man? You see a lot of replicas. Uh, a lot of the mechanical replicas. Magnus gets a lot of replicas. Mm. Uh, Dirtnap gets a lot of replicas. And uh, what is it, Helix? Yeah, well. You'll see them. Uh, 12 of them, $20. Well, gee, I wonder what the, you know. Yeah, yeah. and the, yeah. The, the Helix is basically, it's the Kudu, and Helix is still a brand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but anyhow, that's those are the couple things that really, if you're buying knockoff broadheads, you know, off of eBay because you're getting 12 of them for 20 bucks. 20 bucks. I'm sorry, but you're making a big mistake, you yeah. know. And I'm not telling anybody to go buy the iron wheels that are 100 bucks for three. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do that. But what you do owe to the animal is getting a broadhead and a delivery system that is the best that you can get. What's best mean? Well, go test it, man. Try and figure it out or watch all the other tests that other guys do. I'm not the only guy testing broadheads. Tons of people are testing broadheads. Watch the results. Look at somebody else's. Critique what they did. Mm-hmm. You know, how does that apply to me? So, you know, for me, those tests I do, what I get the most out of them um, is what's the durability of the head? And why is durability such an important thing? When you shoot an animal, so let's take an elk, for example. You hit an elk in the ribs, or you hit just part of the rib, and we'll take a muzzy. Mm-hmm. I shot a lot of muzzies. And that one blade bends over. You've now effectively just cut your cutting diameter down quite a bit. And we're in a game of millimeters here sometimes. And I talked about this in the first podcast. Mm-hmm. The closest I've ever come to losing an animal that I actually found, if that makes sense, was a cow elk I shot. And I literally had two broadhead slices or blade slices through the very, very, very bottom of her heart. I didn't punch a hole through her heart. I just sliced the bottom of the heart. And, I mean, they weren't even that deep. And she stood there in front of us for, I don't know, she was out there at 90 yards or something. And she just stood there and stood there and stood there and stood there. And she stood there for four, five minutes. I don't know. I mean, I lost track of time. And then she finally, all of a sudden, she disappeared. And Mm. it was like, what happened? Well, she fell over when we weren't watching. Oh. But the point to that is anything that might have happened to that broadhead, if those blades would have folded over or whatever, literally all it would have taken was maybe an eighth inch of a fold. And now that elk has a hole through the chest cavity, but it's not dead. Right. There's no slices through the heart. So having a broadhead that structural integrity is there, you know, as much as possible is, is a big key to me. Like if I shoot through an elk leg, do I expect my broadhead to look perfect? Do I expect it to be reusable? No, I don't. And even spending 33 bucks a piece on broadheads, I don't. But what I do expect is that those blades are still intact and that they're still sharp enough to be cutting things up inside of that animal. Cause I prepare for worst case not best case. Mm -hmm. Best case, I'll take a field point that's super strong and I'll just shoot a pencil size hole right through that elk every time. And I don't have an issue, (laughs) right? Right. But that's not what we're shooting. So if I can get guys to think about that and look at, okay, is this strong? Isn't it strong? I mean, easy way to look at it is what is, what is the blade thickness? You know, how thick are the blades? A lot of broadheads, their blades aren't very thick. What, 20 thousandths or, right. you know, Exodus or 40 thousandths. You look at an iron wheel, I think it's, you know, like 62 thousandths or, you know, I, I can't remember off the top of my head all of them, but they're thicker. And you can visibly just see it. Um, what metals it made out of? What's the Rockwell hardness? Right. You know, um, well, let's let's take one that's soft, and and I use Kudu. They're still ones that are in my in my quiver. So if anybody thinks that I'm bashing on them, um, guys, I had them in my quiver and I took them to freaking Africa. So um, you can't say that about me. But they are freaking soft. They are very soft. Yeah, and they, from what I've been told, um, they are a softer metal because they're easier to sharpen. Yeah. See, that's not a priority for me. So, I want to. I'll sharpen it, whether it takes me ten minutes, twenty minutes, whatever. I'll get it to the point where I want it. Granted, some of them are extremely hard. What like it was what cutthroats, 
or yeah, which ones so were I, extremely hard. Yeah, I the sh- cutthroats are a harder steel. Yeah. Yeah, I shot cutthroats last year out of my recurve, yeah. and sharpening those was a nightmare. Yeah, but you're not and, seeing those bend. No, but my and my dad, he works where he's sharpening knives and stuff on a daily basis, and I finally took him to him, and it took him a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, he did it for like, he tried for like 10 minutes. He goes, what is wrong with these things? <laughs> and we finally got him there, but I couldn't do it, not by myself. Yeah. Just a couple swipes with my sharpener, I can get those things sharp, and then it develops a lip on the back side of it, and then I take one swipe, get rid of that little yeah, lip. Yeah, I can, I can feel the lip right there. So yeah. the Kudu, um, you know, I think they're a decent head, actually, but they're soft. They, they bend. Are. That's my only They complaint. bend. I've had a couple break in the test. So the structural integrity is not great, you know? So, Which again, is... it's, a, it's a, probably a great head mm-hmm. when nothing goes wrong. Okay, so, you know, so. if you get, since we're talking about them, the J, okay, yep. so if that broadhead hits bone, instantly curls over, your penetration is pretty much Well, done. yeah, and it's so done. you're pretty much over. Yeah. So, you know, when we, uh, I printed this, I told you guys, I printed this out, I, you know, wanted to talk about some of Ashby's stuff, and, and he yeah. had 10 key elements that he ranked um, for penetration. And I'm going to breeze over them real fast, and then we'll get more in depth. But structural integrity mm-hmm. was number one. Yeah. And it's not just structural integrity of the broadhead. It's your delivery system. I'm going to keep using that term, your delivery system. Because as that arrow hits, it's transferring energy. Well, if you have a weak delivery system and that arrow cracks or breaks at all, you've just lost a lot of your energy and your penetration ability. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that goes into Ashby even talks about, um, you know, having a strong broadhead. So in structural integrity, one of the first things he talks about is the broadheads. So if you have a broadhead that starts to bend, where's that energy going? The energy's going into the broadhead bending rather than penetrating through the animal and doing the killing. Makes Um, sense. Number two is perfect arrow flight. Okay. So that, that really has little to do with the broadhead, but it can have a little because there are broadheads that do fly better than others just based off their design. And we'll get into that a little bit more. His third one is extreme FOC, which is something that I'm torn on, whether I really buy off on, on extreme. Um, four is a broadhead's mechanical advantage. We talked about that a little bit and we'll get in more depth on that. Five is shaft diameter and feral diameter ratio. Again, we'll get into that mm. arrow mass, um, scalpel, sharp broadheads, you know, uh, arrow system profile and finish, um, type of edge or bevel, and broadhead tip design. So when you go through those and you really look at it, I was studying them again today, six out of ten, six out of ten of the keys have to do with broadheads in some sort of fashion. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that tells me that <laughs> that's a fairly important, you know, 60% of, of your your penetration has some something to do with the broadhead in some way. Right. So, well, let's get into that. Let's get into, um, well, let's get into different types of broadheads first. Um, I want to kind of get basic and then work our way into the nitty gritty. If, if you're cool with that. That's fine. So basic, you know, you're going to start out with a two blade. Two okay. blade can be single bevel or it can be a double bevel. Single bevel means basically that the angle of the blade is just one direction. Mm-hmm. What's that give you? It's supposed to give you some more spin on impact. Um, because of the direction of the blades, it actually causes the broadhead to twist and turn. Mm -hmm. Um, People will tell you that it'll breach bone better because it actually will crack and break the bone as it turns. Where I'm a little torn on that whole subject is if that is turning, how much energy are we expending Mm. turning? I don't know. Again, I'm not an engineer and I haven't tried to math it all out. I've thought that exact same thing because I'm for pretty much anything Ashby, I've read it, you know, at least twice, and that that's what I've wondered. So, yeah, if you're using energy to make it twist, wouldn't it take less energy to just drive straight through? Well, and then, then that goes into, too, depending on how your arrows are fletched and the, the mm-hmm. bevel, mm-hmm. is your arrow spinning one way, and as soon as it hits, yeah, they have the to bevel... Match now has to start changing and change your arrow direction. Yeah. How much energy did you, d- did you just lose doing that? That goes back into, so if we get back to it real quick, if we get back to the arrow building podcast. <laughs> right. 
we start talking about clocking our arrows. So we're trying to make everything as efficient as possible, mm -hmm. transfer energy as, as well as we can. So what happens when we clock our arrows out of our bow and they want to go left? So then we put a left helical on it because it's going to give us better grouping because that's the natural direction it wants to go. Our veins don't have to correct that. Mm -hmm. So we're carrying more energy, but our single bevel broadhead wants to make it spin right. Hmm. You know, if it spins, if it spins the wrong direction, what are the chances that it actually starts spinning off the, off the arrow? Hmm. So if you start thinking about resistance on your arrow and the broadhead spinning one direction, if those two don't spin equally, what's the potential for it to start spinning off? So again, you know, those are all potential things, but so I'm not a hundred percent sold on, on having a single bevel. Mm -hmm. yet uh, in the tests I've done I haven't seen an advantage to it but so types of rodheads so two blade more traditional you know, more traditional um, single bevel or double bevel double bevel is going to be your standard you know uh, angle on both sides then you're going to get into like a two blade with bleeders mm -hmm. right so I've that's essentially one. yeah that's essentially the bleeders generally are smaller but they do give you a four blade uh, type hole. And then you're going to have like a three blade broadhead. Um, and then you're going to have a straight four blade broadhead, which is all four blades basically have the same diameter to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to get into mechanicals, you know? Um, right. And so mechanicals are a touchy subject with people. And <laughs> again, they're not legal here in Oregon, but those are your basic rundowns on or that's your basic rundown on the different types of broadheads. What about cut on contact general. versus like a drill so, car? So <clears throat> the other thing you'll see, um, you'll have a cut on contact, which basically means that, you know, the broadhead is razor sharp, hopefully all the way to the very tip. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have like a chisel tip type broadhead, which means it's got a very fine point to it, but they're not blades. They're not sharp themselves. Um, I've heard advertising in the past where the chisel tip is supposed to be the bone breaking part, right? right. It breaks the bone out of the way. Um, in general, um, it is, I, I agree with this, but I'm going to say it is believed that a cut on contact will out penetrate a chisel tip. And so when we talk about lighter poundage setups, uh, ladies, kids, guys that aren't shooting that much short draw length, I would recommend a cut on contact mm -hmm. over a chisel tipped uh, broadhead just to maximize your penetration. So, um, but that's the basic difference between the two. Right. So I'm glad you brought that up because I, I suggest the same thing. And, and typically what I'll suggest is like a, a, uh, Magnus. Um, I don't really, to be honest with you, I've had a bad experience with the stingers. I think they used to be good. Um, and Mike's an awesome guy and I've, I've taught chat with him online and stuff a little bit. Um, I'd probably go with a buzz cut just because I think the stingers, from my experience, we had really bad experience with them. They're just weak, really weak. Um, we had two of them break in one day on hmm. it, just bad. Um, but I think they're also made differently, and don't quote me on that. But I, I think something changed to their process there to where I would steer myself towards maybe a killer bee. Um, Which is what that one is, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, basically – a, a, a longer, maybe maybe even a three to one or, or something similar to that, cut on contact traditional style head with smaller bleeders for a lighter poundage bow. Because I've heard you get about forty percent better penetration with the same amount of energy as you would say a chisel tip muzzy. Yeah. So real quick, the the three to one ratio you just mentioned. Yeah. So for guys that didn't listen to the first podcast <laughs> um, or don't know, one of Ashby's things is he always said your penetration will increase when you use a three to one ratio. <laughs> mechanical advantage what's that mean so you want your broadhead three times the length than you want your width mm -hmm. so it's a three to one ratio so you're three inches long to one inch wide mm -hmm. is basically what what that means um and as we said earlier a lot of the modern broadheads are shoe, super short, short right. and steep so you might have an inch and an eighth cut and a one inch long broadhead or in some cases, they can be, you know, even three quarters of an inch. Look mm -hmm. at uh, Anarchies. Yeah, so Anarchies is, is a yeah. great one. They're not around anymore, um, though. No, they're gone. But I they, I like those heads. But, I mean, they're, you know, half inch long and tough little inch bridges. and a half wide. It's like yeah. that's against everything I've ever. <laughs> so, you know, that goes into what's the disadvantage of something like that. We talked about it before. 
you run a on a straight broadside shot, you know, provided you're going to penetrate through the ribs, there's, I don't really see the big advantage to a three to one ratio. But when we start talking about potential deflections, you know, mm-hmm. that's where you run into um, more of an issue with the steeper broadheads. And remember, I just said, hey, everybody go buy Exodus, you know, if they're yeah. for a price point, super short, super steep angle. Um, but they're super sharp and I haven't had an issue with deflection yet, but I do understand. And this is what everybody else has got to understand is you've got to be able to within your own head, say, look, I'm okay with this because of X or because of Y, you know, um, you've got to, you know, make your own judgments again. Nobody can really tell you exactly what to do, but, um, if you, you know, if you look at a broadhead, like the one I'm holding and you guys can't see it, but it's the Magnus and you start putting it on a piece of wood, you know, and pushing down. Well, yeah. Okay. Right there. So right there, just the tips touching and it doesn't want to deflect. But as soon as I go here and I start trying to push on that angle, it starts wanting to slide, Mm -hmm. you know, now here I've got a much better angle. And again, you guys can't see this, but Garrett and Anthony can, but the idea is that tip has to be able to dig into whatever it hits and when the blades essentially hit at the same time or first, that's a deflection. It's going to happen if you're hitting anything solid. Now, you shoot in the guts, no. It's going to go through the guts. Mm-hmm. But I told the story before on the other one of the bull I shot, and I shot him at 15 yards, and I thought I was low, and he ran out to roughly 40. And I pinwheeled him right where I wanted to hit him, and I was jumping up and down for joy. And mm-hmm. the bull ran over the hill, and pretty soon my buddy's jumping up and down who had been calling the bull, and the bull fell over dead. You know, and I was fletched deep. I didn't have a full penetration on the second shot. Hard quarter and away. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And again, like I said in that other podcast, is that my only? if that was my only shot, I would have been looking for the rest of the season for that bull. Because that was actually my first six by six I'd ever killed. And I was just like, mm-hmm. so we went up there and got the bull, but the arrow was sticking in him and it looked funny. All of a sudden it was kind of backed out. It was a different angle. And I'm like, what the hell? And then I kind of noticed something a little just odd with the hide. And I grabbed the arrow and started pulling on it, and it had hit the last rib, and it was a hard enough angle, muzzy MX3, right? <laughs> yeah. So not as short as like an Exodus, but still short and mm-hmm. wide. Hit that last rib, and it literally just deflected and ran right up the side of that rib cage. Hmm. Hadn't cut the hide out, so it didn't like flame open, and hit that onside shoulder and just stuck right there. Hmm. You know? So, you know, that is the risk you run with a shorter... um with a shorter, uh, wide broadhead. And that's where that, you know, the three to one mechanical advantage. Now look at a Valkyrie mm-hmm. or even, you know, like, uh, one of the longer cutthroats or whatever, but Valkyrie in particular, that little tiny tip that's out there that's super strong at, at, I mean, it's going to have to be a really, really severe angle to where that blade is actually going to hit first. Otherwise that tip is going to hit and start digging and once it's moving through that bone, it's just going to keep moving through it. So, you know, um, there's all these things and that's why there's no perfect answer. So, you know, I mean, you can look at one of these, uh, map Hellraiser there. Yeah. And who's the other one that makes, um, Montex. Montex, Montex are identical to those. Yeah. yeah. The Montex, you know, um, they're a longer broadhead. So again, that angle, Mm-hmm. You know, as you guys can see me putting it on the wood, that angle changes, but pretty soon you can start seeing it wanting, you know, that's digging in and there it wants Mm. to slip depending on the angle. So, um, you know, that's, it's it's the hard choices we all have to make with what's out there. I used the Hellraisers last year and so my hunting partner and and had great success with them. And I also used a four blade, uh, tooth of the arrow. Yep. Um, had great success with that. So. Um, let's get into, um, some of the Dr. Ashby stuff you were talking about. Let's just go one by one. So structural integrity and the delivery system, you know, that's, I don't know how to put it any plainer than if your arrow bends too much, Mm -hmm. if your arrow breaks at all, anything like that happens, that it's not driving through that animal, you are losing energy, you know, and that's why structural integrity of your arrow and your broadhead are important because as either one of those fails, you have just lost, um, 
your energy. So, you know, in, in looking at this, according to Ashby's findings, every tiny or every tiny broadhead tip bend mm-hmm. results in an average penetration loss of 14%. Really? So, again, guys, this is just quoting straight off, right off of his stuff. But so, as that broadhead, if that tip starts to bend, you know, even a tiny bend, you've lost potentially 14% of your penetration. Hmm. So, you know, the structural integrity. So, you know, he says a strong broadhead, um, the strongest broadheads, and he lists them, uh, fixed, single blade. So, and we didn't say fixed, but anything like any, any broadhead that's not a mechanical is basically a fixed broadhead, right? The blades Mm -hmm. are not movable. Um, followed by a fixed multi-blade broadhead and then a component type broadhead, which means replaceable blades. And then mechanicals are the last one (laughs) on his list. And, you know, talking about mechanicals real quick, if you look at the mechanicals in order to, in order to be as big as they are, to have those, that two inch cut, Mm -hmm. um, to be as long as they are to fit those two inch blades and everything else, you have to cut somewhere to keep it in a hundred grain or 125 grain, uh, uh, weight. And so where do you cut? Well, probably, a you know, a, a lesser material, a thinner material, you mm-hmm. know, it's something along those lines. You're giving up something to gain something. So right. I would never, I'm just my personal opinion. I would never shoot a mechanical at anything that has large bone. Would I shoot it at a deer? Mm-hmm. Probably. Well, I think know? most mechanicals are killing deer, to be fair. and They are, but I hear guys, I'm trying to, um, I think I remember who it was, but I don't want to mention his name because he's a much bigger name than me. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I even have a name, but he was talking about using mechanicals for elk and he'd use them all day long. And I was just shaking my head like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't I think, just, you, I I don't don't think you've it. ever hit anything hard because the test I've done with the mechanicals, mm-hmm. you hit bone, they disintegrate. Well, I, I would, I would, uh, I think I know who you're talking about and, and I believe that he's had great success with them. Oh yeah. But I also believe that he's threading that needle way, but way more than the average Joe if can. It, if it's the person I think you two are speaking of, he could probably pick which rib to hit between. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, probably, and again, yeah. it's not a bash on him. It's just, I can just not at all. Just holding this thing. And I'm not going to say which head this is. You can <laughs> tell it's thinner. Because like you're saying, you know, they have to get rid of weight somewhere to make uh-huh. all the components there. I mean, you can just tell by feeling it's it's way thinner. And the, what I don't like about mechanicals is I'm, okay, on a perfect hit, yeah, you're getting this huge hole. Sweet. You are putting something on the end of the arrow that you now have more moving parts for something to fail. So when this head gets here, that's what's getting there. Uh-huh. When this, and it starts going in, that's what's going in. Mm-hmm. When this one goes in, I am praying that these deploy. Yeah. If they don't, I'm getting a field tip going. Or they don't deploy before they get there. Say uh, Oregon, you know, you're hunting the coast. If we could use these things, I think there'd be a lot of guys just scratching their heads thinking, why didn't I just hit that thing if they're using mechanical waltz? You got viney maples. You got all sorts of other kind of brush, leaves, limbs, everything. That's a lot of stuff to make that thing deploy. I mean, it's just going to take one little thing. And granted, we're just a bunch of Oregon boys. We can't use them anyways, I guess on turkeys. Yeah, um, I, just feel like I go back. I go back to in there. if it does deploy. Mm-hmm. In the test I've done, um, it was kind of funny. Like um, shooting through the hide, I had a couple where they didn't deploy, and then partway through the ballistic gel, they deployed. And then, um, like for some reason, somehow, mm-hmm. I literally had one that, like, I don't think the blade broke off. Anyhow, by the time it got to the other side of the ballistic gel, only two. It was actually three blade mechanical. Only two of the blades were still open. Really? You know, so, uh, you know, it's just, I think they're fun. I think, but I think the thing with mechanicals is guys don't have their bows tuned right and they use it as a crutch. I think that's what it is too. Because what, what broadheads will do, um, you know, almost every time is they are going to show you the weakness in either your bow tune, your form or a spine issue you have. Mm -hmm. They're going to exaggerate everything. So guys, I've done it myself. Perfect bullet hole through paper with a fletched arrow. So I'm out shooting all my field points. Great, 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 great. I start shooting broadheads. 20, 30, they're okay. 
I start getting back 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. All of a sudden, <laughs> I'm 10 inches off the side of the target. Mm -hmm. Well, what the heck, you know? So I drop down to 125 grain broadhead from a, or from 125 to 100, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm right back in there. You know, you can have an arrow that with a field tip will shoot a perfect bullet hole through paper. You cannot assume that just because you get a perfect hole through paper, the spine of your arrow is correct. Mm -hmm. Because you can walk outside and put a broadhead on, and that broadhead is going to change things a little bit, and it's going to show you any weaknesses. Now, if the spine is correct, your bow's tuned right, you should not have to make an adjustment for broadheads. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to go broadhead tune your bow. I've done I, that. I've done it too in the past, way in the past. Mm -hmm. Since I started using the process I've used, I haven't had to. So that 29, that 29 broadhead test I did, mm -hmm. you know, um, because of the arrows I was using, and arrows are expensive, and it was a really expensive test, mm -hmm. um, I kept all the 100-grain broadheads with, the, with this arrow. So I had like 12 or I don't remember, 10, whatever it was, 100 grains. And so I went and bought some arrows that would work for those. Mm -hmm. And then I went and bought some arrows that would work for the 125s. And I bought some that would work for the 150s and the 200s. Um, and I mostly use those on bow. But what I did do for the, the uh, I'm trying to remember my own test at this point, but I'm 99% sure that when I shot long range, I used my Axis arrows. And what I, f what I found out was that, uh, this was a perfect example, um, because I hadn't shot broadheads. I was way behind last year that perfect bullet holes through paper, right? Mm -hmm. hundred grade, hundred grain heads right down the middle. Just all of the one twenty fives, four inches left, mm -hmm. every one of them, but they grouped, you know, at 80 yards, they grouped inside a coffee can, all of them, you know? What that showed me was that every one of those broadheads, the bow was tuned, the spine was weak, um, you know, and but every one of those broadheads would shoot out of my bow because it was tuned properly. Hmm. Even with the weak spine, they still would group. Now, in order to get them to come back, I had to stiffen the spine a little bit. That's a whole other subject, but that's what that's going to bring out and show you, you know, um, in the broadheads. And guys use the mechanicals as a crutch because mechanicals, generally speaking, if you're not tuned correctly or you're underspined, are going to be more forgiving because they don't have those blades out there catching the air. And then broadhead design plays into it. You know, I, I talk about being a fan of the iron wheels. One of the reasons I'm a fan of the iron wheels is I literally have never shot a broadhead that I felt was more forgiving. Well, what does more forgiving mean? It seems like every time I make that arrow go off, I never see any weird whips it's just going like ah, oh, i didn't even feel like my pin was there i didn't feel like that was a good shot and mm. yet that arrow is you know mm. right in there i'm not saying i don't pull some sometimes but for guys that have shot broadheads a lot you know you, sometimes you're shooting that broadhead and it's like eh, that one i don't know if it shot right or you know and that shot didn't feel great and the arrow was off to the side as soon as i started shooting iron wheels i could have that feeling of that wasn't the best executed shot. That wasn't this. But yet that mm -hmm. broadhead's still going there. And I translate that over to competition archery because um, I think Wayne Endicott said it to me once at an indoor competition. We were talking about bow tunes and stuff. And I said, man, you know, I've had several arrows today where that pin just didn't feel like it was there, where the shot execution didn't feel perfect. And he just looked at me and smiled because that's how you know you have a really forgiving bow hmm. because I was still getting an X, dropping in that X. You know, and it's the same thing. It's like those, the iron wheels for me just, it's almost like no matter what I do, I can't make them shoot bad. <laughs> right. I've had that feeling with, with the kudus and I've had that feeling with the nap hell razors here. Um, but you know, I was shooting with my prime last year, um, trying to figure out which head I was going to shoot. And I was shooting like five, five different broadheads. I think it was. And the muzzy 100s were shooting different cause they were, um, or the trocars cause they were hundred grain. Yeah. And I was shooting 125, everything else. And so they were shooting a little higher, um, obviously at 80 yards. But um, 
I mean, totally. And, and I'm guilty, and I still do it today where I, I, I still broadhead tune. But you're getting, to be clear, to be fair, apples to apples, you're getting a better tune out of your arrows and out of your bow than I'm getting. Just in my in my opinion, because I know your process over my process, and I know what you do for your tunes. And so for guys, even you know, people like, there's just different levels of things out there. There, there definitely is, and, so, and that's the th when you go get what I what I refer to as a basic tune, right? Mm -hmm. You go into whatever shop and you shoot it through paper, and they do whatever they do to make you have a, yeah. you know, and then you go shoot your broadheads, and oh, you know, they do all right, but they're not the exact same, and so people start talking, well, just take your rest and bump your rest a little bit, you know, and mm -hmm. pretty soon you'll bring the two together, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's you know, Should best case to. scenario for the for the guy who. I don't have he a goes, bow press. You he know, go, that he kind go, of thing. You go to, for not to sound conceited, but you go to the average shop that's mm -hmm. a that doesn't have time to spend four hours with one guy, mm -hmm. just focused on that one guy tuning his bow, or two hours, or three hours, or or an hour, whatever it is. Um, so that's what they have to do, you know. And sometimes, sometimes they don't, and that's why guys will say, "Well, this broadhead flies great for me; that one doesn't." Well, and that goes back to my question, well, why doesn't it, you know, mm -hmm. is it generally to me that has to do with the tune, but like you said, you know, not everybody does things the same. So broadhead tuning is a thing. French tuning is a thing. There's a lot yeah. of ways to get there. Um, what I always try to think about is, you know, efficiency in everything. I'm trying to make my bow as efficient as possible because the bow is then transferring the most energy it can into the arrow. And if the arrow is spined correctly and everything on the arrow is right, that arrow is carrying the most energy that it can. Mm -hmm. And when it hits the animal, is it transferring the most energy that it can? Right. And, you know, where's all that go? So, um, you know, we, we start talking about, uh, you know, different shafts of arrows. When we get into this whole delivery system, it's not just the broadhead, right? So it's, is the arrow brittle? Is the arrow strong? What's the wall diameter? What's, you know, and that's, that gets into a whole nother subject. But the general rule of thumb if you have the stiffer you go in spine, um, to keep wall thickness at a good area, you have to, you increase weight. Right. So there are definitely some arrows out there where it's like, oh, I'm going to shoot this 300 spine arrow, but it's only eight grains per inch, right? Well, that's going to be a pretty thin walled arrow overall. It just is. A lot of those are going to be micro diameters. They make a micro diameter so they can keep the wall thickness up. But there's others that aren't micro diameters that are still really, really low grains per inch for the spine you're getting out of them. Mm. Um, to me, that just kind of screams weaker arrow. Mm -hmm. um, and so then the components we use on the arrow, not to spend too much time on the whole delivery system, but then the components, you know, aluminum's weaker than a steel or a brass. So... Um, when we can use brass components, my ultimate setup that I make for a lot of my customers for myself, um, you know, the axis arrow, because I really honestly believe the axis arrow is an extremely tough arrow. I am a black Eagle dealer and I love their X impact arrows. Um, and just to, you know, kind of throw that out there. I'm actually not even an Easton dealer. Um, and, but those are my two, like if I'm picking two arrows, mm -hmm. I'm either building an X impact, um, or I'm building an axis. So when I build my axis arrows, let's just stick with those for a minute. I use brass head inserts because I want some more weight up front. Um, and I just like the stiffness of the brass. And then I build my own footers, um, which, you know, I brought you some more this time. Yeah. Um, but the footers are all aluminum. But the thing is, is the combination of those. When Ashby talks about aluminum's weaker than brass and blah, 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 blah that's talking about one piece that does it all. So if you're talking about a regular uh, insert, if it's just strictly aluminum and it, you know, or even a half out or whatever, that's going to be weaker than what the same component would be if it was brass. Now, when I combine brass with carbon with aluminum over the top, you're building a multi, a multi-component system that's extremely tough. You know, now if I could find a good steel that I could make my footers out of, mm -hmm. I would probably do that, but right now, because <laughs> I'm having a hard time finding a machine shop that will actually machine my custom footers I want to do, I'm still building them out of aluminum arrows. 
but it's still an extremely tough system. So, yeah, uh, you know, components and what they're made out of. And then um, even your NOx, the transfer of energy from the NOx. So uh, I like fire NOx a lot. And guys go, why do you like fire NOx? Well, I like that they're shorter. And I like that the the uh, materials that, that fire NOx uses, they're actually rated for like higher feet per second and higher poundage and everything. But if you think about a NOx, the longer the NOx is, the more chance you have for movement at the shot. So for a guy like me that shoots 80 pounds at 31 inches, <laughs> right, that's a ton of energy being transferred into that knock. Mm -hmm. And so a longer knock has more potential to flex and move, which can create tune issues. But it also, you know, every little thing, you're just losing, you know, that little bit of, of energy. So, um, you know, that's kind of the whole delivery system is thinking about what you've got and... Again, think about that hard impact on bone. Soft tissue, guys, most of this doesn't matter on soft tissue because no. we're blowing through it. It just doesn't, you know. But you hit bone, and rib is bone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the more that arrow flexes, the more anything can move. Think of it that way. The more it can move, the more energy you've just lost. You know, and so that gets into into Ashby's number two thing when we're really diving into this is perfect arrow flight. And it's not a broadhead thing. It can be right. When we start talking about mm -hmm. having a broadhead tune. Yeah. Um, but that perfect arrow flight that just gives you that th the energy stays, right? You transferred this much energy and with that perfect arrow flight without a lot of oscillation, without having to do a ton of correction, right? Cause if you're, if your fletches have to do a ton of correction, you're losing energy. You know, that perfect arrow flight is then going to retain almost all of that energy that was just transferred from the bow. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's... I he don't did he did his with a uh, recurve or longbow is what he did yes. most of this with. So yeah. um, what you're talking about, you know, the, the perfect arrow flight, I've seen it because I shoot trad so much now. It's So every once in a while I'll pluck the string or something. And I'll be watching my arrow. Say, say I'm shooting. I'd be tempted to say this because I'm not <laughs> hunting this far. But if I'm shooting at a target at 40 yards and I pluck the string, mm -hmm. my arrow might land right where I was looking still. But if you watch it, it's going like this. And the, you can watch yep. the fletching eventually whip it around. Well, if it were to hit animal in an animal when it's sitting like this, yeah. it's instantly fighting more than just Deflection regular. Too, well, and that's why when we get into to longbows and trad stuff you have to tune it's so much that, harder you're tuning your arrow for that perfect flight because there's gonna be flex i mean those those feathers you know a lot of guys are shooting they're shooting off the shelf or you know mm -hmm. they're not drop away rest right so those mm -hmm. feathers yeah. are hitting something and that arrow's gonna move so you've got to try and tune around that and if it you watch to. high if you watch the high speed videos some of those arrows flex so much but they've tuned it correctly to where the vein actually kind of goes around or the feather kind of mm -hmm. goes around that, that shell for that rest and then comes back to straight and correct. So that's a whole nother ball game, you know? <laughs> it's, right. So I, well, I've talked about this a million times, but I didn't, ha I went through the whole learning curve of recurve by myself, you know, just YouTube and stuff. Cause no one around here did anything, but to get perfect arrow flight out of that bow, first off, I spent a lot of money because, <laughs> you know, just, I didn't know in cause there's no, yeah, I can't adjust the rest a little bit and make it pretty good and be good no, to go. You got to start cutting your arrow a little you bit, cut, cut it, a little more. Cut and, yeah. You know, and you know, I won't say who or where I was, but I'm shooting a 55 pound bow and they said, Oh, it's 500 spine. Just shoot a 500 spine. And it's like, well, I'm shooting a 340 spine. And if I were to go any longer or any more weight up front, I'm weak because the way the bow is cut, you know, they, they just try to blanket term it. Well, I don't know if I'd shoot a 500. I think it'd blow up coming out of that bow. <laughs> so. Well, and that's, there's a lot of generalizations and that's where, you know, it's yeah. the, the generalizations could be a good place to start, but you know, um, uh, three rivers has a, like a little calculator deal now where it, you enter like where your bow is cut from center, you know, past or, you know, before center or at center and they can get you pretty close. Um, so that's a sweet tool to have now, but hmm. 
Yeah. So, you know, beyond the the perfect aero flight, then we get into the extreme FOC. So what's extreme FOC? Mm -hmm. So anything above 20% is what Ashby calls That's considered ex extreme. extreme FOC. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I've heard over 30%. It's ultra EFOC is what he calls it. Or, or so he, has, he has something for, he has another term for over yeah. 30. Oh, he does? Yeah. And I think it's ultra EFO or, you know, something like that. But, you know, um, I mean, FOC, again, for guys that don't know, it's uh, front of center. And basically the easy way to calculate it is you don't actually calculate in, you find your balance point. Okay. That's number one. Find your balance point of your arrow. Find the actual center of your arrow. But when we talk about the center of your arrow, we're not talking about the center of your arrow with your field tip or your broad head on there. It is from the end of your outsert collar, carbon, whatever, mm -hmm. to the throat of the knock mm -hmm. is center of the arrow. So from there, the easy way to calculate it is you take the difference between those two measurements. I've always calculated it with my broadhead on. That's not that's not the correct way. So, my... so you find your center mm -hmm. with the broadhead on. Yeah. Yes. Or not your center, but you find your balance. Your balance, balance point. Your yeah. center you find without the broadhead on there. Mm. So you measure you measure your center. You don't have to hold it. So right. for guys that are doing it at home, literally you take a straight edge of some sort mm -hmm. and find the balance point. Right, and then you'll want to mark that, and then literally you measure your arrow from the throat of your knock to the uh, to the end of the arrow. Mm -hmm. Does not include broadhead, filled point, or anything else. Mm. Okay, mark that. Measure between the two. So just let's say it's four inches. So then the math is literally four times a hundred divided by the length of the arrow. That gives you your percentage. That tells you what your FOC is. Most guys, when they calculate it out, are going to find out that they're eight or nine, ten percent. You mm -hmm. know, that's really where a lot of guys generally, that's a generally nine point end. something. You know, nine, ten grain per arrow or per inch arrow with hundred grain tip. Yeah, yeah, super common stuff. I'm usually around yeah. a, uh, ten, ten point five. Well, and that's why a lot of guys. So, the funny thing is, is when you do it with a broadhead on mm -hmm. and you do that length, that changes your FOC. So guys right. think they're here when they're actually less here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Ashby talks about 20% FOC. Um, and one of the things I did find interesting about Ashby's stuff is he started talking about um, penetration using, so he used, it says in this, he used an 82 pound recurver longbow, a 70 pound and a 54 pound uh, bows, all similar efficiency. And he said that on average, the 54 pound bow with extreme front of center, so 20% or above, out penetrated his 82 pound bow with your standard setup. So when we talk about standard setup, let's go back to 100 grain, you know, 10 grains per inch and 100 grain field tip on there, and mm -hmm. you know, you're good to go. So his 54 pound bow out penetrated his 80 pound bow by 48.8%. So, so when we start talking about lighter poundage stuff, you know, uh, women and kids, Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we need to think about running that FOC up, and I haven't tested. I haven't tested that myself. There's guys online that say that they proved Ashby wrong. I talked about Ashby in the first podcast, um, and it wasn't a bash on Ashby. You know, I just kind of felt like I wanted to clear the air for mm -hmm. people. Um, you know, the guy was a. I'm going to call him an eye doctor. He studied eye disease. He worked for the military. You know, that's what he did. Um, but he shot. Tons and tons and tons and tons Hundreds. and tons of, and, and, you know, they'd kill a, a Cape Buffalo, I think it was, and then they would basically hang it up and he would just shoot arrow after arrow after arrow through it, you know, and in detail, take pictures and mark the results. So, you know, these are all from his findings, but it's just something for guys to think about. Um, you know, and we talked about women or kids like my son, my 13 year old, he's only got like a 20 four inch draw, I think, and he's mm -hmm. shooting 45 pounds. Now he can't hunt elk here in Oregon with that, but even deer, it's like, well, what's going to be best for him to shoot? Well, in general, if somebody walked into my shop and said, here's my, you know, I'm only going to shoot 50 pounds, you know, right at the legal limit for elk. And I got a 25 inch draw. What should I do? Right? Well, one, get a cut on contact head. Yep. Number two, let's try and get your FOC up but still keep your arrow weight somewhat reasonable, mm -hmm. you know, 
I don't want you shooting 120 feet per second. <laughs> right. <laughs> because we're running yeah. a 500 grain arrow. That doesn't make any sense. My thing with, with that setup anyways is how far are we going to have him shooting? Uh, you know, because in my opinion, if I'm shooting a light setup like that and all this stuff, and I'm only getting a certain amount of energy out of the bow, um, I'm probably going to keep it inside 30, period. Yeah. So what... I mean, for for me, speed doesn't mean that much to me. If I'm only shooting out to 30, it's more about the momentum and the penetration. Yeah, because right. I, I battled this with Shelby's setup. Exactly. So right now, so I started the year off uh, with shoe shoot injections, you know, what whatever their insert is. I think it's like 22 grains or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then a 100-grain tip. And those arrows fly great. I'm not saying anything, anything bad about those arrows. They were great. They tuned well. They shot out of the bow. Awesome. But then I calculated FLC is like 6.8%. And I'm just like, okay. And it's right around 385 grains total. So now we're shooting those Black Eagle deep impacts, and I feel way better about that setup. It's They come in at like 370-something, so just a touch lighter. But I'm sitting right at 15%. Yeah, and that's I feel so much better about that, hmm. even though it's just a touch lighter. But it's just – and like I said, both setups shot great. But yeah. I just feel way better about this and, one. And that's probably a good place to be in, like you said, Garrett. You know, I mean, how far are we going to have those people shoot? They're not going right. to be shooting 70 or 80 yards. And let's face it, there's a lot of guys out there that will take 70 <laughs> or 80 yard shots. And I'm not saying anything about it. I've done it myself, you know. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but with but the right a, setup. The, with the right setup, yeah. I mean. 31 inch draw at 80 they, pounds. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to let I'm not going to let my 13 year old. No, you know, no, no. Shoot a deer at that distance. Now, is he going to shoot a deer at 25 yards? Yeah, and I expect him to hammer it, you know, with yeah. that, with, with his setup and then what I have him running. But, you know. Exactly. Um, what I will say about Ashby and all this stuff is whether you believe it or not, you've got to give the guy some sort of credibility for the amount of time and the amount of testing he did. Right. I mean, there's definitely some credibility there. Not everything he said might be right, but it's not all wrong, right? There's validity to what he has. Now, there's one thing Ashby said that I don't agree with. His minimum grain arrow is 650 grains. Hmm. Okay. Out of any bow. Minimum? Minimum. So Ashby's, I, I wouldn't say minimum, his perfect arrow. Yeah, I'm about 200 grains Let's, lighter than that. Let, 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 let me rephrase that. I think he called it the perfect arrow, right? Yeah, because I watched him do videos of like 40-pound bows, and they're still shooting almost 600 grain arrows and they're doing like 130 and yeah. it's like mm. so it's 600 <laughs> his his it's 650 mm -hmm. and up you can be 800 900 grains he doesn't care 650 and up and 20 percent foc or or more hmm. that's where you need to be that's his so even like uh, i just tuned a bow the other day to valkyrie system and the guy has almost my exact bow he's a 31 or a 30 and a half inch draw 80 pounds jesus and uh got him new strings, tuned his bow, and he wanted to shoot the Valkyrie, so I got a test kit, and and we ended up with a 200-spine arrow, and uh, we ended up with a stainless sleeve and a 200-grain head is kind of the combo that shot really well. He's 19.1% FOC, mm -hmm. uh, 596 grains. But by Ashby's standards, it's not. that is subpar yeah, because yeah. it's below 650. I'm sorry, guys. That guy's shooting 280 feet per second Jeez. with a 596 <laughs> grain arrow with 19% FOC. He's killing it. That guy could probably shoot an elk right in the knuckle and still blow through it enough to, to penetrate the chest cavity and kill that elk. Yep. I, you know, now I'm not suggesting you do that. Right. But it happens. I, you know, it's. <laughs> I'm getting pass throughs, and I've said this before on multiple things because I'm a short draw guy. I'm 28 inches, 447 grain arrow, 441 last year, and I was getting. I got a pass through on that on that buck I killed last year, at 72 yards. Yeah, and with a four blade, with a four blade, yeah, yeah. and a 10 percent FOC. So there's got to be this but point that's a deer. of diminishing. Yeah, but granted, I did hit bone. Yeah, and it's there's got to be a point of diminishing returns, and what is that? And I don't know. We're, I don't know if we were recording when I was telling you. No. The, yeah. Every bow has a point where mm -hmm. you your weight to how much speed you're losing, you're actually hurting yourself. Yeah, momentum. You, there, have, you have to get to that line and then. There's definitely a point of diminishing return, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and again, it's, you know, everybody's got to do what they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I have a speed range. I'm not a speed freak, but I have a speed range that I like to be in. You know, I know Brent from Valkyrie. I've heard him talk about it before. Um, you know, he likes that 
270 to 280 range, you know, with as heavy as possible. Mm -hmm. I personally really like the 280 to 295 range. That's me, 280 to Ultimately, if I can be right, Mm -hmm. like right where my setup is right now, I'm 287 with a 585 grain arrow. That's what I'm shooting is 287 with a 447. (laughs) I'm at 175 with a 601. Oh, gosh. (laughs) You know. You're down 49 grains. You need to bump that up a little bit. And I got 50. (laughs) That's where me and Ashby You know, I'm shooting 15% FOC. And, Mm. I mean, so what's funny is I actually took some arrows outside and I had some 20% 20% FOC and I had my arrows, you know, and again, I was just shooting them into a foam target. And when I say foam, it's a layered target, you know, so hopefully the density was pretty close mm-hmm. and all things equal weight being pretty much equal. The difference between the 19% FOC and the 15% FOC mm-hmm. was like a half inch. Maybe, hmm. maybe they, I mean, it I think was, they it are. Was, so I'm I'm like I've said it like ten times. Really big on Ashby, but I don't think you have to be up there by that. He really wants up by thirty and all that. But I will say things like or you know six hundred fifty grains. I don't agree with that either. More weight, yes, but you have to find your balance point. Yep. Um. So look at darts. They're super heavy up front. Mm-hmm. If you were to try to throw a dart backwards, it's it's going to be horrible. Um. And I will say. With my recurve, because I think the highest I ever got was like mid twenties in FOC. I could shoot that shaft bare out to forty yards, and it would group. I have pictures of it, and it, mm-hmm. it would hit right with my flat shafts. If I do that with a ten percent, I don't even hit the target. It's, it's kind of <laughs> like look out, world, here it comes because yeah. it just takes I'm, off. I, and I'm not a fan. I you know that fifteen percent number is really where I like to be mm-hmm. running over my son. So my son set up that X impact. I think I mentioned earlier. Maybe I didn't. Um, you know, he's running 17 and a half percent FOC, 495 grain arrow, you know, he's shooting 70 pounds. This is my older son. Mm, oh, okay. I thought uh, you meant not the 45 no, pound. No, 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 <laughs> no, my, my, my older son, he's got a, he's as tall as me. He's got a 29 and a half inch draw already. Uh, 15 years old. I'm jealous of a 15 year old <laughs> <laughs> shooting 70 pounds and he's shooting a 495 grain arrow. That's almost, it's like 17, I don't know, 17, so almost 18 percent FOC. Yeah. You know, killer setup and that that arrow absolutely hammers so um but not to take up too much time on the rest this mechanical advantage we already talked about you know ashby basically said you know a high mechanical advantage um is what you want so high mechanical uh high mechanical broadheads will uh yield better penetration gains among the characteristics of mechanical advantage are head profile uh on a two-edged head uh, and a length to width ratio of three to one, which we already talked about is ideal. And then mechanical advantage also, uh, ferrule profile, smooth aerodynamic, uh, air or ferrules perform the best. And then number of blades, um, becomes an issue. So Ashby wasn't a fan of three and four blade broadheads because mm. he felt that they, they killed penetration. Um, I could agree with that, you know? Yeah. And, and to some, you know, in, in, I agree to some extent, you know, um, that they do as well. Um, study was almost all, uh, all, so in the study, almost all rigid single blade broadheads out penetrated almost all multi blade broadheads. So here's the, here's what I'm going to go back to though, real quick with Ashby studies and what I found shooting bone. Mm-hmm. Each, each water buffalo, each Cape buffalo, each whatever, their bone density is going to be different. From rib to rib, it's possible that there's different densities, different amount of muscles. The problem that we have to be able to do a test and say um, with 100% of surety that this is better than that is that we don't have anything that's that consistent that is what we shoot. So we, there's no animal out there that we can, let's say you're shooting a leg bone. Well, you shoot a leg bone. And you're shooting the same leg bone with four different arrows. Well, mm-hmm. as soon as that arrow hit, what did it do to the, you know, where the next one's going to hit right. and stuff. So all I'm getting at is that that actual laboratory type, this is very scientific and proves that this is better than that, isn't really out there because all the animals 
are a little different. Yeah. Well, I don't think there is yeah. a perfect test out there either because there, no. someone's going to find something wrong with everything. I, well, <laughs> and I don't think there can be, but no. Um, and so then let's just I, again, I want to blow through these pretty quick because I know I want to talk about a lot of different things. But shaft diameter, you know, everybody talks about uh, everybody talks about you know I got to use a micro diameter or I should use a micro diameter shaft, micro diameter shaft because you know it's going to penetrate better. What Ashby found, at least from what I'm taking from this, that as long as your arrow shaft is 5%, is what it actually says here, smaller than the broadhead's ferrule, then you will basically get as much penetration out of that, again, all things being equal, that you can. So you take like an axis shaft. Mm -hmm. I haven't done the calculation, but I can almost guarantee you it's 5% smaller than what a standard ferrule is because when I build my footers, you know, and we put them over those arrows, like on my 260 spine arrows, mm -hmm. when I put my footer over it, I now use a 5 16 field point. 5 16 is basically the size of most ferrules. My iron wheels basically fit on there perfect. There's no gap anymore. But as soon as I'm past that footer, right, I've dropped off. Mm -hmm. I gotta, I gotta believe just in my pea brain here without doing the calculation that there is a 5% difference in shaft size from where the footer is to where the shaft is. Mm. So what do you gain by going to a micro diameter shaft? Well, you gain the potential for more FOC because generally a micro diameter shaft is less grains per inch than say an axis arrow is or any of the, so when we start talking about arrows, micro diameter shaft, uh, 0 0.166, 0 0.165 shaft, versus a 0.204 shaft, right? Yeah. So an injection or you know, a Pierce Platinum. Or, or yeah, or an X-Impact or, yeah. or any of those. Um, I think even those deep impacts are still a 166 shaft. Yeah. They're just uh, they're just heavier grains per inch. Yeah, and then, uh, like I said, I shoot the Instincts, and those are also micro, but they're also heavier per yeah. inch. Um, but the sleeve on those is big, and it meets to a 5 sixteenths point. Yeah. And then it just tapers down and then yeah exactly so but that's so shaft size i don't get caught up on i need to shoot a you know a, a shaft that's the a 166 which is guys when we say 166 or a 204 that's the inside diameter that is not the the outside diameter mm -hmm. um you know but having a shaft that is smaller than the ferrule does increase penetration some um he doesn't get into to how much I got another question for you. What about, I think it's grizzly stick. They use a tapered shaft. Yeah. What's your findings on that? So my findings on that. <laughs> money. <laughs> they, they, they are money because they're, they're a harder process. Um, they're expensive. I, uh, what I, going back to Ashby, mm -hmm. um, the reason those shafts are around is because I, I, he didn't invent them, but he basically said, you know, a tapered shaft that's tapered on the front towards the back mm -hmm. is great. If it's tapered on the back towards the front, it's bad, right? Which makes mm -hmm. sense. So, oh, but okay. to me, um, again, being OCD about my tuning and stuff, that's lending to inconsistency in your tuning because you have an arrow now that is not at full draw. It is not as level or the level has changed. Mm to where it is three quarters of the way through, which is where roughly we want our drop aways falling away. You know, you want your drop away rest. So it's starting here and then kind of here by it's, the time it, the rest. It's starting, you know, let, let's just say when I set a bow up and I put it in my bow vise and I level the string and then I level the rest and I level the arrow. Right. Right, that level that I have hanging on that arrow is just in front of the shelf, mm -hmm. okay? And it shows perfectly level. Well, by the time with the tapered shaft I get to full draw, if I was to put that level back on there and everything else was still level, it's going to be showing that I'm tail low, right? Makes and sense. And the front of my arrow is running uphill. Now, how much? I don't know. I mean, uh, this tapered shafts, I haven't gone through and, and actually gone through and checked. Have you ever actual have you messed with them? I have. So I this year, um, I bought myself um, a basically a test pack. Um, of the 240 spine grizzly sticks and the 170 grizzly sticks. And, you know, I actually got a pretty decent tune out of the 170 shafts, um, but they were so heavy. Um, I think the shaft alone 
without the broadhead was like 600 grains or something. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> um, you know, and so the two forties, I couldn't get to spine out of my bow surprisingly. Um, because I can get a 260 axis and a 250x impact to spine, but the 240 spine grizzly sticks I couldn't get. But, you know, the tune, it shot a great hole through paper. Um, I was disappointed in the components. We talked about this the first time. When you think about a tapered shaft and then you go slide a component over it, um, that component, so we'll call it a half out because that's really what they use. Um, think of it like a one-piece hit insert with a footer, mm -hmm. right? Um, it has to be able to go over the thicker part of the taper, right? So by the time it gets to the back... There's play. There's a little potential play. Now, if you squared your arrows, that's great. But again, now we're squaring on, you know, like my squaring tool, you know, it's all um, level, but now we're squaring an arrow that's not level, mm. right? It's tapered. So how square is it? So what I noticed was, I mentioned this first podcast, and maybe I did something wrong, guys. I don't know, because I know a lot of guys love the grizzly sticks and they don't have an issue, um, is that I would cut my arrows. I would square my arrows. I would spin them. They looked like they spin, they'd spin great. I'd put the component on. It'd spin fine. It'd been great. I'd go to glue it on, pull it off, glue it on, shove it on, let it dry, and I'd start spinning them again. So, well, why is that one wobble? Well, it's... I think what it was was the components were wobbling, but it still played, you know, mm -hmm. messed with my head, you know, at that point. So hmm. I just wasn't an overall huge fan, and I think it was, they're expensive. It's and, it's bad. That's why I've never played with them, because I don't remember how expensive, but they're, I mean, it's outrageous, and that's. I'm trying to remember, too. I want to say, I don't remember. It was, it was a lot. You're gonna look them up now. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's it's horrible. And, right. and Victory's now making the the Grizzly sticks, the momentums. Again, I'm not here to bash any company. A lot of guys love them, um, and they're yeah. supposed to be able because of that taper. They're supposed to be built in FOC into those arrows already. Mm -hmm. You know, so for guys that really want to get extreme on their FOC, that's another way to do it. Um, I just wasn't really sold on the tapered shafts, and so some, sometimes it's like I, I use that that acronym kiss mm -hmm. you know keep, keep it, it simple, simple. Yeah, yeah keep it simple stupid <laughs> yeah so they go big to small on grizzly sticks right yes okay and you're saying according to ashby that's the way you should go looking at this head it's the exact opposite it starts small and goes yeah. to big so <laughs> right is, yeah i mean I, do you think that's an issue with and i'm not going to say which head i'm looking at that no way. i i don't think it's an issue an issue on that aspect because it's such a small space plus we're opening if you that's look, what i'm saying so when the point you, goes in it's small and then it yeah but but, but if you look at where your cutting diameter is on this head and guys you can't see this but the the whole width of the opening is before we ever get to the thick to part that hmm. so i don't think that's as much of an issue i think what ashby was talking about when he talked about like the reverse taper where the backs it's it's now you're creating more drag mm -hmm. right through the whole thing but what i do wonder um, because i didn't look at it is you know, Ashby said that, you know, you want an arrow that's 5% smaller than your broadhead ferrule. Well, the front of those grizzly sticks is actually fairly, fairly large. Mm -hmm. So if you're not using their um, broadheads, you know, because I'm going to assume a lot of what grizzly stick did, was, did or does is based off of Ashby stuff. Right. I'm going to assume that they've built their broadhead ferrule to be bigger than their, their arrow shaft following Ashby stuff. But if you took like an Iron Will or an Exodus or anything else, is it 5% smaller? You know, I mean, is that ferrule 5% right. larger, excuse me, than the arrow shaft? So, you know, or is there a lip? That's the the last thing you want is the end of your arrow or your component to be larger than, than the, the ferrule. ferrule that brought mm -hmm. in. I was thinking about that with the footers. Um on, on what broadheads I was I was actually just trying to think I'm like I wonder if this trocar is going to be smaller than the than the footer with the, with the shaft I don't which is possible but I'll we'll so have to find out I found I don't think so but um, it may be this this is more about arrows but so at the house we just bought I found some aluminum arrows and I looked them up and they're they're supposedly spined about right for my recurve so I threw on some field tips 
well, they're five sixteenth field tips and old aluminum arrows. You know, they're way bigger mm-hmm. than that. So yeah, there was this huge lip, you know, from where it just was bigger than the field tip. And uh, I was shooting them, and they weigh about what my micros do. And you know, my micros are going in say eight to ten inches into that target. Those aluminums, which weigh about the same, and I'm sure it's more the field tip thing. They were only going in like an inch and a half. <laughs> and then whipping up, but I'm sure it was because of that lip. So that's exactly what you're saying is, you know, the lip is bad <laughs> on that side. Hmm. So, um, so and that's the footer that's a little, yeah. So I'm, I'm holding the footer here with an axis. It, arrow. That one's a little big and it's pretty darn close. I mean, it is super close. So yeah, I, so I feel when you use the footers that. I just gave you, the new work. ones, it'll yeah. be even better. Yeah. Um, and are, I mean, you're really cutting hairs. I mean, if, he says 5% and somehow you measured it and it was 3.5. Are you going to notice? No. And I think the, I mean, it's, I go back to, you know, these animals, once we get into the blood, it's a lubricant anyway. So, mm-hmm. you know, I don't think anybody can really say that a 166 shaft is going to out penetrate if all things equal or equal on an animal on ballistics gel. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you hands down. I've shot ballistics <laughs> gel a lot and the micro shafts. But it's it's a, it's less surface area, right? Yeah. So on ballistics gel that wraps back around it, mm-hmm. of course you've got less surface area, so less resistance. So uh, mass arrow weight, we've talked about that quite a bit, um, a little bit, ar- you know, already. Um, you know, everybody's situation is different. My suggestion in general, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say this to more towards your average man out there that's shooting a bow. Mm-hmm is try and get your arrow weight, in my opinion, as high as you can with, I would love to see people actually be 12% or higher, closer to 15%, and stay, you know, in that 270 to 295. You do not need to go faster than 295. I don't care what anybody says. Nobody's ever been... One, as you start getting over 300 feet per second, you create other issues planing. with planing and, and yeah. all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, now, there's exceptions to every rule. You know, a guy comes in and he's a 25-inch draw. I'm talking about your average. What's your average guy? 28-inch draw, shooting 70 point. pounds, right? Mm-hmm. That guy should be able to get a 450-grain arrow, yeah, you know, with, right moder- with modern equipment to shoot in the 280s, you know. Absolutely. And if you, get, if you get 15% FOC, you know, then... In my opinion, you've probably captured, you know, or you're probably as close to, you know, an, as optimal a setup as you can get. And when I say that, what I'm taking into account is a little flatter trajectory for the guys in Oregon. Again, I all I really know is the West Coast. <laughs> when I'm hunting the coast mm-hmm. and I need to put an arrow through a hole, you know, I don't need my arrow having a huge arc because I'm shooting 240 feet per second. Right. And I'm trying to shoot 40 yards, and I have a hole out there at 30 that i got to put an arrow through. And I don't need a huge arc. That's why I like to stay in the in the speeds that I like to stay in. If I'm shooting in the wide open or if I'm shooting out of a tree stand and I'm only shooting 20 yards, 30 yards, then by all means, you know, jack your arrow weight up, mm-hmm. drop down to the 230s, you know, go for it. But... For the type of hunting I do and the type of hunting most of my customers do, you know, this is what I found works the best. That speed to weight ratio Mm -hmm. gives you the best of everything. You don't have a huge arc anymore at your arrow. It's shooting relatively flat, flat, but you still have a good weight. Now, if you're a guy like me and you can get your arrow up to 585 and 15% (laughs) and you can shoot 287, Mm -hmm. hell yeah. You know, I'm going to always shoot as heavy of an arrow as I can. You know, could I build a, you know, 500 grain arrow and be 310? Yeah. Would I want to? No. Mm -hmm. You know, right. Shootability starts going out the window at some point. Well, here's another thing for trajectory for me is uh, uh, trad guys are more prone to this than, than us compound guys is if I'm shooting a, let's just go Ashby 650 grain arrow, I'm probably like at 230. I mean, I, I'm shooting super slow. My bow, I just don't have the wingspan or or the muscle to do to get it up to 280. So if I'm shooting 600 and, and uh, let's just say I'm shooting 230 feet per second, I'm shooting an Ashby arrow. 
Okay. If I'm off two yards at two, three yards at 50, I'm probably missing it. I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't shot that slow. So I, when I had a Matthews chill R and at that time mm -hmm. I was shooting really heavy, mm -hmm. you know, full metal jackets, brass inserts, heavy heads. Okay. So I hit a bull. We were over East and I hit a bull. Now, not fatally wounded, didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, this bull's fine. The guy with me mm -hmm. that was ranging for me, because we were on the move. This herd was just on the move. It was a huge herd. Anyways, the elk are coming this way. He ranges, he ranges the tree that these t these elk are going by. Well, the elk was actually about five yards back. He ranges that tree 51 yards. I hold 50 spot on, and I was actually five yards off. That arrow just barely hit him right at the very bottom just just enough to draw blood and as soon as the arrow got there i was like oh god and yeah we went and i stood in his tracks yeah it was five yards off but what you're saying that heavy of an arrow and slow me down that much right it's going to cost you an animal if you're if, off if you're off you have less room for error yeah, now, yeah. if i'd have been shooting a 420 green arrow i, I would have 10 ring that thing yeah. probably yeah and and we don't i don't want anybody to think that that's a a crutch to use you know no but it you, you know it you can't you can't just say well i'm shooting fast so i can afford to be off right it's right but but it does there give is you. It, it gives you a little more room for error and that's where know? i'm going and, with yeah, that it's yeah. from a guy that i've missed so many animals without a range finder if i don't range it unless i'm absolutely sure and i pre-range something i will let it walk off before i, <laughs> I miss it i've just you know i, I i'm I, with you i range it that's what I do. I didn't range that bull last year, but I ranged his cows just before he came out on the same trail, right around 50 yards. So I didn't range him, but, um, you know, I, I like to, to make it easy for me to still screw up and still kill something. So if I'm off by three yards at 50 or two yards at 50, I'm still going to kill that deer or that elk. But if I drop down to that 230 FPS or whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm swinging and whiffing and I'm, potentially using my only uh, my only opportunity last year or whatever on that elk or on that deer because I wanted to shoot a super heavy arrow and that just doesn't make sense to me but at the same time you get the opposite end of that so this is your experience but just from hearing you yeah so the wildebeest you shot yeah killed it great you know sweet but the arrow deflected yeah I since the day you told me that story, I would, of course, you could never recreate it. Yeah, good luck. But I would love to know if you would have been shooting a 550 grain arrow, that arrow probably wouldn't have deflected off the end. It's it, really hard to say. And I would shoot you will that never know. if I could get, like I said, I'm, I'm with Chris on this one 280, 290. Mm -hmm. That's my sweet zone. I've shot that for years. And I like that one not only because the, I like the trajectory, but I know my pin gaps where I need to hold over without adjusting. So yep. I can shoot. Huh? And, well, what I was going to say is some of that comes back to, again, there's not one perfect setup. So, there's not. Okay, so let's just, I've never been to Africa, but let's just say, okay, you're going to Africa, and mm -hmm. you know you're going to be sitting on water holes, and the average shot is going to be 40 yards. Oh, right? go heavy if you want. And, yeah. yeah, you know, <laughs> like, why not build a setup for that, tune the boat of that, and when you get back, you know. And, but guys want a, seem to want a, you know, one one size fits all right. type thing, you know. What I will say is there's nothing wrong with shooting a deer or even a coyote with a 585 grain arrow, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. shooting heavy within, you know, a, a, again, certain realm of things isn't a bad thing when it comes to smaller animals, right? It's, it's not like, oh, I'm going to go shoot a deer, so I need to drop down to three, 350 grains. Right. And I'm going to go shoot an elk, so I need to go up to 450. Well, why not shoot that same deer with a 450 grain arrow? <laughs> That's what I do. I use the same arrow. And granted, if I was shoot, if I was doing antelope or something, I might drop down. But um, Yeah, cause, well, antelope. <laughs> That's funny because we're going – my son's going on an antelope hunt. We're going over this weekend. Yeah. And we were kind of talking about that. But, you know, um, I'm not dropping his arrow weight. He's shooting. But I did change a few things just to make – everything a little quieter because those are the spooky, spooky, mm -hmm. spooky, and very fast, mm -hmm. very fast. I mean, they'll jump they'll jump your string in a heartbeat. I know a guy at the coast that he shoots a longbow, and he he shot at one. He had the heart mountain tag. Yeah. 18 yards, and the antelope was no longer there when his arrow got there. <laughs> <laughs> so,
So I don't know how long have we been going, man? Uh, hour and a half. Oh, wow. we got a lot to get through, and we've been going let's, forever. Let's keep pounding through it. So. Um, so let's just go on. Scalpel sharpness, you know, with broadheads, this is something that's really important. You can't shoot a dull broadhead. Montex are notorious for coming out of the package kind of dull, right? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> and hard to sharpen, Well, right? I want to I bring up a post that Iron Wills did where they tested the sharpness and the penetration using that machine. I don't know if you saw it. They posted uh-huh. it on Instagram. And they were getting way better penetration just because of how sharp theirs were out of the box. Compared and it makes to well and edge retention. So again, yeah. this might be a very minute micro thing, but let's mm-hmm. go back to Ashby's number one rule, structural integrity. Mm-hmm. As you start pushing a broadhead through flesh, even as the edges start to curl over, you're creating more resistance, mm-hmm. right? Think about that. So again, it might be infinitesimal. It's just, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're not, the broadhead still looks really, really sharp and you barely curled the blades, but you did just lose some energy. So, right. you know, scalpel sharpness yeah. and great blade retention is a huge, huge, huge thing. So I'm handing Chris a, a tooth of the arrow that I killed <laughs> that. That's the one I killed that buck with. These guys. So again, there's, there's two, there's two groups of people. I'm not going to say companies because mm-hmm. Kudu's never accused me of anything. Tooth of the arrow, I've actually had some of their people mm-hmm. accuse me of stuff. Oh. <laughs> but I'm holding a kudu and a tooth of the arrow in my hand right now. These are two, these are two groups of people that think I act, I absolutely hate them. And they've, I don't, I'm just going to, I haven't gotten bashed much online. Uh-huh. But when I have for my broadhead stuff, it was those. it's been these two groups of people. <laughs> Should I take a picture of you right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the tooth of the arrow, um, you know, I was really actually excited about this broadhead. Um, I've come to learn that I don't like stuff that's vented as much as I like stuff that's solid because mm-hmm. it's a spot. It's not a sharp spot. It's a spot for meat, tissue, whatever, to get caught on. Oh, I, see. I could see that. And it creates um, noise. Um, and they do create noise. That's why I was so excited when Iron Will came out with their solid broadheads because I loved their broadheads, but they did make some noise. And I was willing to accept that noise for what I was getting out of the broadhead. Now that they're solid... They are absolutely dead quiet. Really? Um, but anyhow, so the tooth of the arrow, what's funny is on that bone test, it's for guys that don't know tooth of the arrow, they're a solid machined uh, broadhead, meaning it's a fixed blade, non-replaceable blades. They are machined out of one piece of, of steel. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would think, um, and the blade thickness isn't bad on them, you would think that being that it's a solid piece of steel and it's machined, that they would be ultra tough. Mm-hmm. The test I did, and I haven't tested them since, and I only tested them that once, but when I hit bone, two of their blades sheared off. Really? At the ferrule, completely gone. Hmm. Huh. And the other two bent. Now, in their defense, they are not the only machined broadhead that did that. Um, VPA, another company I believe is a good broadhead company, I shot one of their three blades. Mm-hmm. And by the time it came out of the bone, it was a two blade. It literally bent one of the blades flat. It made it look just... So if you just looked at that laying on the table, you'd say, oh, it's a two-blade. Yeah. No. It was a three-blade. <laughs> one of the blades sheared off. Really? And the other blade bent flat. Bishop Broadheads is another one. A lot of guys... I don't hear a lot about Bishop anymore. But Bishop, claim, Bishop Broadheads claimed to be the toughest broadhead on the market, period. And they had three different grades. Um, but they, they, they flat out told me that their middle of the line broadhead would outdo any other premium broadhead on the market for durability, period. They sent me some to test and I told them I was going to be honest. They sent me a single bevel um, that, uh, I'm trying to think of what I would compare it to, but it was just a standard single bevel, very thick, Mm -hmm. hip bone, a little bit of a chip on the front end. Other than that, blades look great. They sent me a three blade, again, solid machined. And it was, I think they called that one their pipeline um, broadhead, which was their middle of the grade, sheared a blade off on Mm. bone. So, you know, it's kind of funny to me that bone will actually shear blades off of a solid machine piece of metal. Um, What I did notice, shot Montex, is I keep getting told that I'm wrong, but it, (laughs) it, it, they're a cast of some sort. Now people have told me before, it's just the type of metal. It's not actually cast, but they actually, to me, when they break, it's a cast metal. There's, it's very porous inside. It looks like 
what a cast metal would look like to me. And I'm not a metal expert, but um, there's another broadhead company that I tested their stuff. I believe you pronounce it uh, Hewner Heads. They're out of like Holland or somewhere. And they had a video. I saw their stuff and broadheads just look really wicked. I'm like, oh, these things look cool. Hmm. Pretty big cutting diameter. And the guy shoots a steel plate. It's a thick, like three quarter inch steel plate. And his broadhead sticks in it. Hmm. And I'm like, oh, wow. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> so I order some. They're like, I can't remember how much they were. I order them. It takes them two or three weeks to get there. I tested them and they were junk. Hmm. And when the blades broke on them, they would plane real bad. They wouldn't, they just would not fly. They would, they just had a lot of planing to them. But when the blades broke, it was a cast metal. Hmm. So, um, I know Montex make a couple, they do make a stainless one, right? They, they have their the carbon steel, their carbon yeah, steel. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of guys have killed with Montex, but they're not sharp out of the package. I noticed with Montex, you either get, there's, there's only two people. They absolutely love them. Best broadhead ever. Yeah. Or these things are so horrible. Yeah. Cause I was just looking at Montex actually. Oh, were you? Yeah. Um, I like for Shelby setup. Not I for like me. the strikers. Um, I shot my first buck ever with a bow with a striker and it went through what well, went through the first shoulder and stuck into the second and they're just a replaceable blade, you know, yeah. pretty thin blade, but one of them had a little wave to it. Huh. The tip had a little curl. Other than that, it was fine. But yeah. and that, like I said, that's through one shoulder and into the second. Well, that just broadhead you're holding there went through that that buck last year, and I just wanted to show you that because I've I've had a good experience with with the durability, but I haven't shot bone directly. I and like the idea of those. I just I it, it can't did, do it. It did clip blade. a little bit of bone. There's and some then, there's some a little bit of wave to it. And there stuff, is. But it's, it's not. On it's it, not in but. bad shape. And this is their XL version, right? This is yeah. The, the one twenty five. So, and it's, it's a four blade. Again, guys, this is why I know it gets expensive, mm-hmm. but this is why I encourage guys to go test stuff on their own. Yeah. You know, again, we'll, you know, go watch my video if you want. Make your own assumptions. I told people right in the beginning of that video, I'm not going to tell you what's the best broadhead out here. I'm just going to show you exactly what they did. Right. Period. You know, and and uh, for anybody that wants to see my video real quick, just throw a plug out there and, you know. <laughs> go ahead. I'm not going to tell you to subscribe to my channel because I don't put much up there. But um, if you just look up uh, 225 non-typical mm-hmm. on YouTube, you'll find, you'll find it. You could Google search 29 broadhead test. Uh, or 29 broadheads tested one day. You'll find it. You'll see it. You'll know there's bone there. Yeah. Um, and it's a giant pile of bone when we're all done on a lot of broken parts. But um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, these two Thieros, I liked the idea as well. Um, they're a chisel tip for, again, the guys that can't see them. Um, and I really thought they were going to be the coolest thing out there. But, um, you know, the other thing we haven't talked about real quick mm-hmm. um is blade retention. So on replaceable blade broadheads, blade retention is a huge thing as well. Uh, You're good. The, the If your blades don't stay there, if your blades don't stay in the ferrule, mm-hmm. they're worthless. You know, you've got a, right. fa- you got a fancy field tip, right. really. And so I am going to pick on a company here, and I will probably get a ton of hate mail from guys. But I'm going to pick on Wacom a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to do it for a very specific reason. In my humble opinion, <laughs> Wacom has the worst blade retention on the market. Really? The way they go into the front of the ferrule is not super secure. The way they get held on by the washer is not super secure. And guys are going to go, well, Exodus is the same thing. No, it's different. The front is held better. But the biggest difference is... The washer and the way the blade is cut out on an Exodus is very long. That that blade cut out is long. So that ferrule, if you were to think about your broadhead unscrewing from your arrow, mm-hmm. you would have to unscrew that broadhead almost completely for an Exodus, for that washer to move back far enough for a blade to fall off an Exodus. You take a quarter turn off a Wacom, mm-hmm. and that washer moves it all, and all the blades will fall out. Really? And the problem with that is, again, being a thinner blade, they start bending. You get a little bit of a bend. I can't tell you how many animals I've seen shot with a Wacom that don't have all three or four blades by the time it's done. I watched a cow elk get shot in the scapula with a Wacom. She pulled the arrow out. We watched her bite it and pull it out. Hmm. When it came out, all that came out was the ferrule. 
Really? The blades weren't there. Right? The blade retention, anybody putting them together and trying to spin them onto an arrow will know exactly what I'm talking about, whether they want to admit it or not. <laughs> Where I, what I am going to say about Wacom's is they fly really well. Another broadhead that just seems to fly really well. So they've got great flight characteristics, weak blades, and horrible blade retention. Hmm. And that's just not something I, that I personally can accept out of a broadhead. Like, right. The blades have to be able to stay there. Hmm. So They remind me of a striker a lot. Um, they do just worse blade retention. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, uh, I've shot, I think, two or three deer with Wacom's. And one with a striker. and They definitely will kill. I know lots of guys that have killed they, stuff with uh, them. The Wacom's were always in worse shape. Now, one, you can't hold it against it. It it was a little muley buck standing on a rock bluff. So when it went through, it hit that rock bluff. So, okay, well. But it was gone. It was just little shreds of broadhead. But. Yeah. So, um, but that's that. And then, uh, you know, he talked about arrow profile and finish. I'm not even going to talk about that. We've already talked about profile a little bit. Type of edge. So... You know, Ashby's thing, if we're talking about his stuff, single bevel was the best way to go mm-hmm. in his in his opinion. Um, so I'm not – here's my two cents on this. I want a bigger hole than what a two blade's going to give me. You know, and even a single bevel that is supposed to cut an S-shape hole, it's still a slice versus a hole. And so when you look at, like, my broadhead test and the holes that were produced in that hide – I want a hole. Mm-hmm. That's what a three blade or a four blade gives you, or even a uh, you know a, a two blade with bleeders. Right, right. Um, so like shooting the iron wheels. So my buddy Jay, he shot a bear with an iron wheel this year. He started shooting iron wheels, and it left a it left a really nice hole in that bear. Um, you know, I talked about in the first podcast that cutting diameter is cutting diameter, and that's all you're going to get out of it. All things being equal. Unless we start talking about bunching or something else, you know, of the skin and the hide. Um, and that's where I go back to, like, uh, you know, I've seen several holes from Anarchies. That's one of the broadheads. I'm going to say, okay, yeah, it might be an inch and a half cut. You're probably going to get a bigger hole than that. Why? Because the front of that is flat. It does not have a sharp tip. Now you've just lost some energy because of that tip. I will guarantee you've lost some energy. You've lost a little penetration. Mm-hmm. But it's going to make that skin bunch, and it's going to open a bigger hole unless you hit something solid. So in my um, in my testing I did, I had some backer board before the ballistics gel. So, you know, when the Anarchy hit, there wasn't enough give there to create a bigger hole. But that is, for guys, again, I go back to, for guys that say, my broadhead, you know, look at these giant holes it makes every time. No, it, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> you want to believe that, but think about it logically. That broadhead can only cut as big of a hole as what the blades are unless it's on an angle, unless the skin bunches for whatever reason. Maybe it's bunched because of the way the animal's standing. Maybe right. it's bunched because the broadhead pushes it in in between two ribs. Yes, you, I've, I've shot animals where the hole was bigger than the inch and an eighth cut. But there was some other reason to that. It wasn't something magical the broadhead did for me. Mm-hmm. So you, it's not really a valid argument to go, I shoot this broadhead because it produces a bigger hole, you know, and it bleeds more. A cut's a cut. A hole's a hole, mm-hmm. right? You know, for the most part. I just tend to believe with a single bevel or with a single, with a two blade, let me go that way. It's not just single bevels with a two blade. A slice is never as good as a hole when we talk about bleeding. And we all know elk. I talk about elk a lot. Elk are super tough. Mm -hmm. And I need blood to follow because very rarely do I watch them fall over in sight. You know, and an elk can, elk can run a long way, a lot. Think about their stride versus a deer stride. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take the same amount of strides, you know, a deer runs 150 yards. Well, that's probably 400 yards with an elk taking the same number of steps. Yeah. And if you're in thick cover, like the coast range. Yeah. 400 yards with no blood is... Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. So, you know, that's that. And then um, broadhead tip design, we talked about chisel tips a little bit, cut on contacts. I don't really have a lot more to say about those. It's just, uh, you know, I, I do think there is something to be said for bone penetration with a chisel tip mm-hmm. because it does start potentially start, instead of trying to cut through the bone, 
it is actually breaking that bone and it can create fractures and things in, in, you know, in a perfect world. So, um, I did have yeah. a broadhead I want to pick your brain on, and hopefully okay. you've tested it. It's the toxics. <laughs> <laughs> the meatworm. You know what I'm oh, talking yeah. about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had a buddy who killed one, and, and, and he shot them. They shot great for him and everything. I just I could never get myself to use one. And plus shooting my target with one. If I'm shooting with you and you're using a toxic, you're not shooting my right heart. I'll tell you that right <laughs> no, now. No. You know what? A, to- <laughs> a toxic can make one hell of a hole. Yes. Um, again, I go – I think – if you were to look at the blade thickness, the Rockwell hardness, and just the general design, you know, it's it's not going, it, you're going to lose penetration with that broadhead. I don't care what anybody says. People say, no, they penetrate the same. No, they don't. Yeah. You're punching a hole versus cutting a hole, so to speak. I watched a video where the guy shot phone books. Yeah. And it, it didn't go through a third of the phone books of a, just not even a cut of contact, just a different head. And right. I saw another one, the guy shot a deer with it, and he killed it, no problem, you know, and he was pro-toxic. Well, he's like, well, all you got to do is bend the blades back because the yeah. blades <laughs> open. He's like, you just bend them back and then yeah. sharpen a little bit. It's like, you it, just bent your blade. <laughs> take, take this head. If I try to bend this blade straight, if it was or crooked, it would break before it yeah. just bent and was like, oh, yeah, that's good. There you go. I yeah. know. You know, I think if, if anybody takes anything away from this podcast – what I would like them to take away from it and think about a little bit more is stop thinking about your broadhead as just some cheap disposable thing. Yes, they're disposable. Yes, they might hit a rock. Yes, mm-hmm. they might bend. Yes, they. But it's it is probably the most important component you have. You know, second by the delivery system that's delivering it. You know, and then everything else falls in after that. Right. It is what kills the animal, guys. I can't say it any clearer than that. And if you're shooting cheap junk, I'm not telling you to go shoot a $33 piece broadhead. I'm really not, you know. Um, I do it for my own reasons. But, you know, you got to be shoot the best broadhead that you can and critically think about your setup because that's what we owe, that's what we owe to the animals we're shooting. Right. And just because it's always worked doesn't mean it's necessarily the right thing because again what happens when it doesn't work you know i've killed i was trying to count the other day and you know way back in the day when i started hunting you know you could get two deer tags and you know so i'm trying to think of how many animals i've shot with a bow um with the out-of-state hunting and stuff i've done probably 40 Hmm. animals with a bow and I'm going to say probably 80% of those were with a muzzy of some sort, <laughs> right? Same here. So, you know, I mean, I go back to the original muzzies I shot with the aluminum ferrule, and they were longer and the weak blades. And then the MX-3s came out, and they were shorter, and they had a steel ferrule. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, sweet, because my ferrules aren't going to bend anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I watched a guy shoot a, a black-tailed deer that was bedded, and he hit the scapula, and literally the arrow didn't penetrate at all. The muzzy hit, and it turn 90 degrees Hmm. basically bent (laughs) and that was it he put a hole in the hide and stopped in the scapula but you know find a durable broadhead stop thinking about it as you know that's the cheap part you know okay you know i mean Mm -hmm. we go by arrows and and you know most arrows are what a hundred bucks a dozen, hundred and twenty bucks a dozen yeah, for just for now. just yeah that's cheap that that's your cheap to maybe middle of the grade arrow mm-hmm. right you know so you're shooting a ten dollar a piece you know arrow and you're spending you know thousands of dollars on your bow you know and thousands of dollars on camo a lot of guys mm-hmm. and you're gonna go buy you know. 20, six for six or six for 36 bucks. You yeah. Know? And you see <laughs> you know, that with like four, four for, you know, $29, whatever it is. Yeah. It's like Amazon or eBay or, you know, it's, it, that's what's doing the killing and you're not doing yourself or the animal any favors by, by having a week. And, and like I said, you can get three for 40 bucks if you, you know, that price point and still have a very durable broadhead. Right. And you don't have to shoot an Exodus. There's a lot of them, you know, I'm not slick tricks. For some reason, you know, they've shot okay, they've shot not okay, shot okay, not. But they're a good broadhead, you know, if they, the, what are they, the wasps. 
mm-hmm. wasp drone, you know, all those, uh, there's a lot of good heads out there. You don't have to do the expensive ones. Um, you know, but you need to find something that works for you and think about all those different, mm-hmm. those different reasons. You know, what happens if I hit hard bone? What, what's the potential for deflection? What are my blades going to do? Is this going to fold over? Um, you know, I, the, like when I go back to iron wheels, why do I shoot iron wheels? Well, it's an A2 steel, which is a very expensive steel. Um, it is a tool steel. From what I understand, it's a tool steel like S7. Who else uses S7? Well, Bishop uses S7. Valkyrie uses S7. Um, a lot of the higher end companies, but you're getting what you pay for in those, in those steels, right? It's, I mean, think about a tool steel. <laughs> it's extremely hard. Rockwell hardness of, of, you know, in the high fifties to, to sixties, right? You know, um, that just means more blade retention, more blade durability, right? You get into, uh, you know, down in the forties and you've got a really, really, really soft broadhead, you know, and, you know, do you want to take your one opportunity at an animal? You know, maybe you get two or three, maybe you're the best hunter in the world. Okay, great. I don't, right? I get one or two opportunities a year. Do I really want to take all that time and money and gas and everything else I spent Mm -hmm. and shoot an animal? And because my broadhead was 10 bucks, you know, and it was weak, I potentially just lost that animal. Because how many guys have you heard, I made a perfect shot and I lost the animal? Okay, it might have looked perfect, and maybe it was going perfect. You talked about your African mm-hmm. hunt. That arrow was right behind the shoulder, but it deflected, mm-hmm. right? What did you say? It came out the it went came in out the ribs. Through, uh, came out, got the back of the lungs, and it came out in the gut. Yeah. I mean, it took a hard. It got both lungs. So what's that mean? It went in pretty far, and then I'm guessing the back of the arrow smacked a rib, and then. Yeah. So, you know, who knows? I'm not, you know, I'm not blaming Kudu for that. No, we don't know what happened, but what I'm getting at is, you know, trying to eliminate those variables, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you have a weak broadhead that will bend, what do you think that's going to do to the trajectory and the energy of your arrow? It's going to start steering it too. Your veins aren't steering this thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. So if it takes a take, hits a rib and makes a 40 degree bend in your arrow, what direction do you think exactly. that arrow is going to push yeah. and turn? You know, again, we're, we're in a game of millimeters here, right? And we need hemorrhaging and we need hemorrhaging of arteries and tons of blood and lungs to deflate. That comes to sharp broadheads also. So I was going to say earlier when we were talking about Montex and stuff, you know, some guys hate them. They say, oh, no blood trail, none. Well, this, this Naphill razor is pretty much the same broadhead, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That bull Mitch shot last year. Granted, it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> didn't really go yeah, anywhere. That's but a good story. The amount of blood on scene was unreal. I mean, I just well, when it died, yes, but until that point, it but had it to didn't fill go. Up it didn't go anywhere. Twenty yards. Yeah. So yeah. there wasn't a lot of time. But so it's the same head. Well, you we were talking about you know Montex hard to sharpen. Well, I think that's where you're getting that issue. Is I don't know if they're hard to sharpen. They just don't come very sharp. Yeah, and yeah. Guy, a lot of guys won't sharpen. They just think they should. Be I able actually to think those are pretty it. easy to sharpen on a on, you slay them flat on a stone mm-hmm. and yeah. You know, but a lot of guys will take a package, open it, and think they can just go, go. Yeah. Well, no, that thing needs to be as sharp as it can get because it's easier for your for those blood vessels to clot when it's. Well, think about if you've ever cut yourself with like a, a butter knife. It doesn't bleed for very long. It hurts, but it doesn't bleed for long. Cut yourself with a razor blade. That thing will just freaking pour blood. Mm. It's because it's harder to heal. So mm. the sharpness thing is what I was thinking of right yeah, there. Well, guys talk about serrated. So, you know, we haven't gotten to that. There's broadheads that are half yeah, serrated. You a know, buzz and cut. That's, like that's one. Yeah, that I, just I bought some last night. You know, and that's <laughs> supposed to supposed to make uneven cuts in the in the tissue, right? Which doesn't allow the tissue to kind of seal back together, which stops bleeding and I, you know, or, or hinders it. I don't know. Blood trails are a really hard thing because every animal is different and every hits a little different. You know, uh, my Mount Emily bull didn't hardly bleed at all, but I know why, you know, cause the skin covered back up the hole. There's mm-hmm. just too many factors. It, there's way too many factors in a lot of that stuff. You know, my very first archery bull though, I made a horrible hit. Muzzy again, Muzzy MX3 oh. <laughs> um, with that one and made a horrible hit, actually hit him just in front of his back hip. 
in the spine. Oh, that is horrible. And yeah, he was he was he was walking, and I took the shot, and I had guessed the yardage wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't no range finder at the time, and just guessing yardage. And he ran off, and my hunting partner wanted to beat me over the head with his bow. He was so <laughs> mad at me. Um, but the one thing I remember seeing is he ran off was just a ton of blood all of a sudden. I'm like, what the hell? And he runs off, and I'm, you know, even though in my head I thought I saw a bunch of blood running down his side, uh, I, we're never going to find this animal. We gave him like an hour while we waited for two other guys to show up. We had radioed, <laughs> and they came in, and all right, where was he standing? Well, right here, well hell there's blood all over the place what the heck and we start tracking him well luckily i'd gone in between two vertebrae Mm. um and i'd hit that femoral artery oh nice and that arrow just sat in there and wallowed it out but you know it's it's the whole point to that is that bull bled like crazy you know and the arrow was sitting in a weird angle and stuff so you just don't know you can't blame the components necessarily for the lack of a blood trail um and you can't necessarily say it's because I shot this broadhead that it had a better blood trail, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Too many variables, too ma- too much difference. Um, I do know that Bill from Iron Will, you know, he originally, when he built the Iron Wheels, he did just a standard two blade. And they shot a few animals. And the blood trails weren't great. So he didn't want the bleeders, but he put the bleeders in it. Then they shot a few more animals. The blood trails were much better. Um And that's my, I tend to believe that's why I don't shoot a straight two blade is Mm. that your blood trails potentially are not as good as they are with a hole. So a slice is not as good as a hole. Other people will disagree with me because they've shot a ton of animals with them and the blood trails are great. Again, Mm -hmm. tons of variables, but my big thing is durability. Mm -hmm. That's my number one. And that goes into structural integrity that, that Ashby talked about. That's where you got to get into the whole delivery system. Right. People got to start thinking, you know, about their arrows, you know, because that's what's flying through the air. That's what's hitting the animal. And that's what's doing the killing. Right. You know, well, my thing is, is, is you don't have to be loyal to just one manufacturer. Right. Like, and, and this leads me into my closing thought is, is there's not going to be one perfect broadhead. I don't, I don't think there is. I mean, I like to shoot a bunch of different ones. Um, you know, a gobbler guillotine is going to be better for decapitating gobblers than a kudu (laughs) so there's my point right there but if i'm going to be shooting a gemsbuck has a very thick hide very thick um i'm probably going to want to shoot a cut on contact more than i would something like a toxic right where we're talking about penetration getting through that hide we had bolts expanding almost immediately granted we're using sst's and stuff like that um those bolts were almost expanding immediately when they hit that hide and then i asked the outfitters like well yeah it's the toughest hide in africa pretty much like extremely tough hide you'd see blood come back out the entrance when that's how tough that hide was <laughs> never seen like that before in my life and so i'm like thinking I'm like what would i do if i shot that with my bow well i'd be okay i'm using a cut on contact head but i'm like well heads would not be good and so we need we really need to wrap our heads around what kind of setup do we have um a, a, a traditional style light bow low poundage short draw, whatever it means, what, traditional what, what style. Are we hunting? Yeah, mm-hmm. what are we hunting? And traditional style, I like the bleeders myself. I wish the kudu had bleeders. Uh, would a bleeder work with a single bubble? I don't know. Uh, Dirt yeah. nap makes them. Do they? Yeah, you'd, well, like Ramcat is a three-blade single bevel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, I'd be interested in one of those. You know, um, and I shot those blades came off, but, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a good broadhead. <laughs> you know, it's... Again, there there is not, I don't believe, a one size fits all, and and no. I encourage people to do some testing. And yeah, it's expensive, but again, I just keep going back to, you know, get out of that, get out of that, that Mindset. mode of that mode of what's the best broadhead? That's no, get out of that mode of, that's the part I can go cheap on. Uh you know, yeah. and I will probably punch you in the face. Not you, but if I, you know, I, I want to, when I meet guys and they're like, I had a, a friend of mine, he's like, yeah, I bought these off eBay, dude, look how cheap they are. And I just literally looked at him and I'm like, I literally just want to slap you right now. It's usually the guy holding the RX one, $1,600 bare bow. Hey, no, no, this, this, <laughs> no, this, no, this guy I'm was not. holding a Matthews, but he had just bought a thousand dollars with a QU. Yeah. See, uh, that's yeah. what I'm saying. You know, <laughs> it's usually the type of, you know, the guy Willing to spend twenty four hundred bucks on right. his bow setup, but then wants to spend ten dollars on a six pack of broadheads. It's like why? What? Yeah, well, the knockoffs. You see it on archery talk all the time. The guys are like, "What do you think of these knockoffs?" You know. <laughs> and now there's the it's tough. They're who, just that. Who was it? Uh, 
who is it that's making the plastic one? Oh, the, um, um, I just like at cheap, those cheap shot, cheap shot. But yeah. if you look into those, um, what they claim it's for is like turkeys. Oh yeah. Oh, I believe that. But you know, there's going to be some guy out there that's like, they're a buck a piece. I'm going to shoot him a deer. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's going to be that guy and you know, we'll probably never change that guy's mind. No. There's other guys, they've done it for a hundred years this way and this works fine. And that's great. Um, and again, they will kill. I mean, yeah. you know. I'd like to go over an episode, and maybe I'll do this in the future, on gear priorities. Yeah. Boots over broadheads. Stuff like that. Because to me, if you're not getting to your hunting spot, you're not shooting anything. Well, there's always that old argument. <laughs> I go back to my grandpa, and he didn't bow hunt, but, you know, mm-hmm. the guy wore jeans and, you know, flannel, yeah. flannel shirts. And, Fred Bear. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, you, you cut hairs with all this gear stuff, and I'm just as guilty as anyone buying gear, testing gear. Yeah. 30 years ago, they were wearing blue jeans, shooting arrows that are about as big around as this pop can <laughs> with, you know, what we, what now I wouldn't even screw onto an arrow for a broadhead yeah. and guys were killing stuff yeah. well, and they were doing 190 feet per second. Yeah. You know, I can tell you if I was going to go to Africa or somewhere like that, would I take my iron wheels? I'd have no problem taking them, but would I probably change to something else? Yeah. I'd probably go to a much heavier, higher FOC. Yeah. Me too. You know, um, you know, like that, uh, I don't have it with me, but you know, I tested, like, I think it was a 200 grain cutthroat that was a single bevel and it was just a big old nasty head, you know? Yeah. I'd probably take something like that, you know, not because there's anything wrong with the iron wheel, but because I want to pump my FOC up. I want a better mechanical advantage. You know, I want more of that three to one ratio, you know? Um, and cutting diameter is another thing we haven't even really scratched on too much. You know, there's arrows out there, there are broadheads out there that are one inch and inch and an eighth and this and that. And to two inches. You know, yeah. I, I want as much cutting diameter as I can. It still flies well. Exactly. You know? I want, uh, you know, and, and granted, that's where we go back. There's no best broadhead. Nope. But um, I think we covered a lot. So let's go over closing thoughts real quick. <laughs> uh, let's start with Anthony there. I don't know. We, we covered pretty much everything. I just, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple. It has to stay together. It needs to be sharp. And well, the biggest thing is you have to put it where it goes. Right. Because yeah. you can have iron, we're going to use their name again, iron wheels that are $100 a three-pack. Solids. How about that? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> solids. Great broadhead. You know, no complaints. But if you hit it in the back knee, well, it doesn't matter what you're shooting. You know, it's so. Yeah. Well, you're definitely on point with that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, you know, I, I've said it a hundred times and I'm going to go back to, you know, you said it right. Shot placement is, shot placement is key. You mm-hmm. could kill with just about anything, but let's just assume that our shot placements are, you know, average, decent, but sometimes we're going to hit bone, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, um, it's durability, durability, durability. I want as much cutting diameter as I can to stay intact. I want the blades to stay intact so that they are still doing their job inside that animal. I'm going to, you know, in, in my closing, I'm going to go with, you know, what happens when I don't get a complete pass through, you know, I want that arrow in there doing as much hemorrhaging and damage and, and whatever as it can. Mm -hmm. And in order for it to do that, you have to have a durable broadhead, you know, but in order to get into there, you have to have a good delivery system. So those are my two things right now for people to think about a good delivery system. Mm-hmm. with a very durable head. You do those things, I think you've at least done a lot of what you can to ensure that you're going to make, you know, a good clean kill on an animal, right? Right. That's, you know, that's yeah. that's about all I got, man. That's. I think for me it would be, uh, follow suit with you, it would be durability. Uh, things that I look for is durability, um, Accuracy, because you know the longer the head you have, like just 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 take those long muzzies, those MX or those those green ones, those hundred grains. The longer it is, the more important that straightness is, and it, and it can be harder to keep that straightness the longer you get. So I think that's maybe one reason why a lot of the manufacturers are going to these shorter ones. It's easier to keep straightness. It's easier to keep everything nice, compact, and straight when you have a shorter. Well, feral, and, and not to get off on another tangent, because I know we've gone really long here, but yeah, um, you know. Thinking about that, <laughs> the longer you get, the more variance there is from what your field tip is. Mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of manufacturers started going short. Yeah. Is because 
when you screw a broadhead on, things change. And we haven't really covered that aspect that, well, look, my, my 100 grain field tip is three quarters of an inch long or half an inch long, mm -hmm. right? And then I go screw a broadhead on that's an inch and a half. What did that just do to the spine of my arrow? Because that changed the overall length. Even though when we start talking front of center, we don't include the broadhead, you've just made your whole system longer. That changes things a little bit. Hmm. You know, what potentially has that done? That's why guys have gone shorter. Yeah, you know? and that makes more sense. Uh, that makes sense to me. <laughs> and But that's why you need to get your setup ahead of time, not two weeks before, se before season. <laughs> you know, that's why guys yeah. guys take the whole winter off. No, the winter is when you start refining, looking, looking at your new setup for the year. I yep. usually give myself about a week after the, <laughs> when September ends. I usually take about a week to just kind of hmm. step away, and then I'm right back to it. See, I critique my stuff, and then I usually wait for like the ATA show and all the new products, uh -huh. and then I start looking at okay, what came out, what yeah. changed, what's different, and that's how I found most of the broadheads. I found it was like, oh, that's different, that's new. I'm going to test it. I'm going to grab it. You know. And I'll spend money, you know, and that and that's the thing is I look at it this way is I spend, you know, I buy a new bow every year. I'm not ashamed to admit it, Yeah. you know, so I spend 1600 bucks because I like carbon bows. So I spend 1600 bucks on a new carbon bow every year. Hmm. Well, if I can afford to spend 1600 bucks on a new carbon bow, spend I better money. be able to afford to spend three or 400 bucks testing new stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and critiquing my setup. If not, I would rather see guys keep their bows. You know, I had a Bowtech Patriot in the shop the other day to tune up. Tuned up fine. What's that, like you a know? 2008? <laughs> no, it was a 2005. Oh. You know, <laughs> guys killed a lot of animals, still killing stuff. Yeah. I'd rather see guys keep their bow and test mm -hmm. new broadheads and stuff every year to come up with a better broadhead and a better delivery system right. than buy a new bow every year and keep buying, you know, the eBay Chinese knockoffs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because... <laughs> A, a 2005 bow is going to kill something. If it's shooting at 270 and your 2018 shooting at 270, the arrow's getting there at the same time. So it's what's happening once it's there is what matters. Well, well let's put it this way. What's going to kill better? At that 2005 bow that has a durable broadhead that stayed in the chest cavity and kept cutting versus my 2018 bow that I made a crappy shot and I used it you know, cheap ass broadhead. Mm -hmm. And now all I have in there is a fancy field point. Right. Mm -hmm. Which one's going to kill that animal faster. If at all, that's I'd rather take the 2005 with the really durable broadhead that's in there doing damage versus me losing blades, breaking off, bending, whatever, going in with my brand new fancy bow mm -hmm. in my brand new fancy QU, you know? <laughs> right. And I, I love QU. It's not, it's not a knock on them, but you know where I'm going with that. Like I do, you know, Guys, what's more important? Right. Right? You know, and and that's how I, I wish people could look at it that way. Be, not because I'm going to sell more. I'm not even really much of a retail shop, right? I'm a tuning business more than anything. Right. So. Well, I think that's that's enough for me for one day. And <laughs> I, I I think we dove, we, dove, we dove into it enough to where people can finally get to the point where you need to get out and shoot your bow. You yeah. need to go out and test these things. I mean, I'm happy to do it and show you on YouTube of, of what I get. And I know Chris is as well, but at some point my setup is not your setup. I'm not hunting what you're mm -hmm. hunting. I'm not shooting the same arrow, same FOC, same feet per second, same momentum, none of that. You need to figure out what's best for you. And the one thing that's really helped me is, is making that transition to where I'm trying to hunt all year round. There's no time to get lazy. You need to act like you're hunting all year round, to be honest with you. And you got Turkey spring bear, you've got whatever, safaris or whatever you're going on you know you can hunt axis deer this time of year whatever it is you can hunt hogs you can hunt hogs any yeah California. any time of the year really in texas i'm sure they're happy for you down well, there anytime and and here's the thing guys is you know i mean you don't have to go buy a bunch of broadheads to test so start with this mm -hmm. the last five animals you killed what did your broadhead look like when you pulled it out what did your arrow look like did it break off did it go all the way through mm -hmm. where the blades bent mm -hmm. okay what did i hit that made them start critiquing that's the thing is, is your experience is value. Everybody's experience they've had is value. Mm -hmm. Critique your value though. Critique your experience. Right. What did my stuff do? Do I want it to do that? Was that a potential, you know, for something bad to happen? That's how I started. I was critiquing my own stuff. Blades kept 
bending on me. And then that right. cow that I, you know, barely got in, and it started to start putting two to two, two and two together. And I'm like, that could have gone south really, really quick. <laughs> okay. This means I need a better X. Right. And, and that's all I really want guys to think about is critique your own stuff. You don't have to go buy 20 broadheads to test. You don't even have to go buy five. And you know what I have, I'm sure a lot of guys are like me. I've got a lot of different types of broadheads right here. Um, you could trade a broadhead for broadhead. I think you, you and I have done that before where I'm like, I want to try that broadhead. And you're like, Archery sure. Talk actually has a whole thread for broadhead swapping. Yeah. See, there you go. Problem yeah. solved. Use heads that's far to use to get ones that you haven't. So, all right, guys. Well, that's going to be this episode. I appreciate everybody um, listening to this uh, this podcast. And if you have any questions, as always, you can get a hold of Chris. Chris, what's your contact information? Uh, you can call me at 503-932-8003. You actually gave out your phone number. I did Is that, that a last, landline? I did that last time too. Oh. I think. So 932, <laughs> so 503-932-8003. That is my cell phone. Okay. It's the only phone I have. Um, you can get a hold of me on Messenger through Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, you can message me personally or you can go to my Elk River page. Um, and then I'm on Instagram as well, just mm-hmm. under Elk River Archery. Uh, there's some underscores in there. So, and then, uh, other than that, you could also email me at 225nontypical at gmail.com. Okay. And I get, guys look at me weird every time I give out that email address. So I'm just going <laughs> to tell everybody right now, I shot a buck that's 231 inches <laughs> gross, 225 net back in 2007. And that's how that, that's how that, that email address came to be is it was like, really? I, my life's all about hunting and, you know, so I had that's, no idea you shot a buck of that caliber. That that's my handle on a lot of <laughs> a lot of a lot of forums. So I fish for local guys. Yes. I'm two two five non typical on I fish. <laughs> it's just something I've used everywhere else. I'm non typical two two five the other it's flip flopped on archery talk. Uh huh. But anyway. I try and stay off there. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I go on there and lurk. I read a lot. Oh. You know, again, and I use other people's experience, you know, and that's the thing, guys, it goes back to all this. Use everybody else's experience and, and mm-hmm. kind of learn and, you know, and, and, you know, try and try and improve your setup in some way every year. Otherwise, what's the point, right? It's, right. you know, it, that those little improvements, that doesn't mean a new bow every year. It doesn't have to mean that. For me, I'm an idiot. I, <laughs> I like giving my money away. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> well, Anthony, what's your contact information? We need to grow that dirty trad page yeah that's just that's just an instagram thing actually okay it's it's not it's not on facebook no it's not if it is i don't know about it so no that's just team dirty trad and that's on instagram um yeah so you got like a hundred something followers on there now yeah it goes up and down i just i just started posting on there again um when the team fell apart yeah i'll say garrett uh turned turned his back on me um, I kind of just let it <laughs> sit there. I forgot how to sign into it there for a while. Oh, and then did you? Just here in the last like six months, mm. I've kind of started going on there and being a little more active here and there. Um, so that's where you, that's where you can find me. And actually, after after the last podcast I did with you, I had a few guys get a hold of me on there. Oh, really? Yeah. And one of them I actually knew. Huh. He started talking to me. I'm like, pretty sure I know this guy. And then, so and I did, but so. All right, guys. Well, let's uh, let's just conclude the uh, broadhead episode. Hopefully, it's as beneficial as the error episode was. I know a lot of you guys got a lot out of it, and I'm sure we're going to have Dirty Trad and Chris Dunlap back on the show again. So, hopefully, thanks, yeah. Thanks for coming on to the sh- coming on to the show, guys. All right, guys, that's this week's episode of the podcast. Thanks for joining me. I had a great time with Anthony and Chris talking about broadheads. They're both a lot of knowledge. And then Anthony really brings that traditional style into the podcast. And Chris, he just, he's, he's the tester. He's the one that goes out, tests everything, researches it all. And uh, I really love the, the aspect of, of bringing up the Dr. Ash because you can't really do uh, a broadhead episode or an era episode without talking about the Ashby files because there's a lot of information there. A lot of it is really good to, to, to build your setup around. So thanks, guys, for coming on to the podcast. But let's go ahead and choose a winner from the five-star review comment um, giveaway. And it, this is going to be some beef jerky, the original recipe from the Off Grid Food Co. And a uh, really cool guy who I got to sit down with at the uh, Hoodoo Shoot and wanted to hook the podcast up with something to give away. So this is some really good jerky. It has been so hard not eating this jerky. <laughs> so it's lucky it survived until the giveaway, to be honest with you, because I got a bag for myself. This stuff is really good. 
Um, so let's go ahead and choose somebody. It's going to be Troutman72. Last Wednesday, he left the review. He said, was first introduced um, to this podcast from the Go Wild app, which I'm on. And if you're not on it, definitely get it. It's, it's like a Facebook slash Instagram for hunters. And if you post a picture of a dead deer, it's not going to get blurred out. You, you can really be yourself on there. You can post pics about what we do and, and not get slammed. It's a very, very positive and, and welcoming group on there. Uh, but he goes on to say that he heard about it from from the from the app on there and uh, really enjoys the podcast. He's from the West Coast and and uh, just really appreciate that comment and the feedback. And uh, that comment and review got you some beef jerky. So message me at GarrettWeaverHunts at gmail.com uh, or you can get a hold of me on Instagram at On Point Podcast with Garrett Weaver, whatever, uh, YouTube, Facebook. Um, there's plenty of avenues to get a hold of me. Send me your address and I will send you this this uh, package of jerky man so outside of outside of that guys i appreciate everybody joining me and i will see you on the next one bye